the good thing about the, the morning session is that people they are more yeah. focused i think those after lunch sessions are very difficult to to get the attention yesterday it kind of collapsed after lunch quite rapidly Oof. yeah 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 the body's doing too many things at once it's actually a brilliant book it's a brilliant book So uh, thank you very much to everybody, and um, uh, I think um, Terry McAllister and Yanis Trifilis will um, moderate this panel, and they will introduce these um, owners, uh, some very young, some a little bit less young, and I'm sure that uh, a conference like, excuse me, Sorry. Um, a conference like this, uh, uh, the future is now. I think we have, uh, in some way, the present and the future of the industry. Yesterday, we had the um, chairman of the various associations. Perhaps among these uh, so called young chip owners, we can have the, some of the future chairmen. Uh, who knows? And um, I think they will tell us a lot of interesting things. So Terry and uh, Yanis, please go ahead. And uh, this is our second and last day. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Francesco. And um, welcome, everybody. And welcome to my panel here. Um, we're delighted to have you here and to discuss the future is now, and perhaps if that is relevant to anybody and everybody, it, it's most relevant to a younger generation. Um, we, yesterday we heard from um, uh, Mr. Camporini from the Italian Institute of International Affairs, and he, his, his general thrust, if I could paraphrase, would be to say, the only thing certain is uncertainty, and expect the unexpected. And I wondered, I sometimes wonder whether that's something to do with um, getting to a certain age, like myself, like Mr. Camperini and others perhaps, um, that we become perhaps less flexible, um, perhaps more averse to change, and whether the younger generation, which um, I'm going to ask you about because we've got your benefit here, um, is, is, is um, more able to deal with that and, and, and sees change is less threatening. Um, having said that, I've been reading a book which I really do recommend um, to everyone, which is by a New York uh, Times journalist called Thomas Sell Friedman. It's got this rather curious title of thank you for being late. And that actually refers to the fact that he was kept waiting by somebody. And while he was waiting for this visitor, he started thinking about how change is moving so quickly in the world, particularly digit through digitalization, that, that humans actually find it difficult to keep up. So he, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. He's researched it a lot, and it's really saying that we as human beings actually are struggling um, chemically to keep up with the pace of change, particularly through digitalization. So that, that suggests that it's not just a matter of our age, it's actually something that is happening. Let me introduce the panel members here. We've got two uh, Gavaronis who are cousins. Um, all these um, panel members are from family firms in Italy. Uh, Giacomo Gavroni is the president of the, in of the Italian Young Ship Owners Association. He's a law graduate who's now in charge of the commercial department at Finage Armamento Genovese. This company is largely involved in offshore work, and Giacomo has already spent two years working in Brazil, overseeing work for, Bra for Petrobras, the state oil company, which is interesting. Um, his, his cousin, Filippo, is on the board of directors running the Crystal Pool, which is a ship management business, 
that um, mainly oversees bulkers, and he's been looking. He's mainly working around the commercial and the S and P side of that business. He's got a degree from the European Business School in London. Um, Andrea Garola, the Bard, um, is. Um, an economics graduate, he's from Naples, he's working in the chartering department of Med Offshore, he's also a board member of Sada Bunkers, and was formerly president of the Young Italian Ship Owners Association. Uh, and finally we have a, a woman, which is very, very nice for us, because we're short on the ground, women in the industry, and that's maybe an issue we can um, talk about, why, why that's so slow in happening. Um, but Andrea is an economics, um, sorry, Maria Lauro, um, Laura Dell'Abati from Amaretti Group. She's the vice president of the Young Italian Ship Owners Association. She's currently studying for an MBA in finance and says she's passionate about the marine environment, which is nice to hear from someone in the shipping um, community. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a preliminary question, and then um, I'll be helped by Yanis um, here, who's going to help me moderate, and he's going to ask some, uh, some, some other questions so too. Very optimistic um, of you. <laughs> so uh, can I go back to that? It's, it's maybe an unfair question um, to ask you, uh, Maria Laura, but I, I, why, how difficult is it being, being a woman in shipping, and particularly a young woman in shipping? And, and are there sort of systemic issues, or is it just um, this is a traditional industry and so it'll take time for, for the gender equality to establish itself? Uh, from from my opinion, I think that I have a biased view about this topic uh, because I'm from a company, Amaretti Armatori, that is uh, not really in line with the industry because uh, the 100% of the board is um, a woman composed, but it's something that is a, a rare thing in, uh, in Italy and in our uh, industry. And actually, if we look at the number, there is only a 12, 13% of the board of director in the East industry that uh, uh, is uh, with uh, at least one woman. So, the, the equal, <coughs> the equality in the gender in the industry <coughs> is uh, far away, I think. And uh, since we are more or less all from family business, it's even more strange because uh, it's like a uh, woman facing difficulties in rising and in shining even in their own family because uh, the 96% of the, the uh, companies in the shipping industry in Italy are family owned. So you are in your own family and you still are having problems in arriving in your board of director. And uh, it's something that is, uh, I, I don't have all the answers why it's happening, but still I can say that uh, with, with my company, with my experience, Knocking wood, we're doing well, so. Yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so the point is uh, not being woman better than man or man better than woman. It's just we're doing different things in different ways, but we are both good. So what I can ask to the audience, uh, to the senior generation that is listening, I, I would like to ask, uh, to all the people present in the room to believe in the, their daughters in the same way they believe in their son. Because uh, <laughs> the, the opportunity are there and uh, we can do both well. Thank you very much indeed. I think the, the reality is that, that it's, it's always deemed to be kind of an issue for women women, uh, gender equality, uh, uh, and the reality is that men have a huge responsibility and perhaps more of a responsibility because, because they're better represented already. So tell me what you guys are, are doing to promote women inside your businesses.
Francesco, Nicole Francesco, always is one of the best to be, to be, to be young. Uh, we don't have today programmed to have this space in such a venue because I mean we are very happy. I represent the young ship owners and I'm extremely happy to have the space to, 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 to say what we think. Then uh, who I would like really uh, to thank him and to thank all the comers. Uh, I'm not Valeria Novella, just for uh, uh, information. Um, I'm uh, then, uh, you, you know, I think that in, in, in our company, for instance, I have to say that uh, uh, we are uh, far away from uh, being uh, totally, I mean, uh, open to uh, women. This happened, be, I, I think that this, uh, this reason has its roots in our history, because in our history, in a lot of family company, for instance, there is a, a transmission of share that uh, maybe sometimes involves just uh, the uh, male part of the family. Uh, in, the, in a lot of uh, um, families, normally we have the real estate, that is the house, that goes to the, to the, to the, to the, to the women, and the share, that means works, that uh, uh, goes to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the men. Then now, also, if uh, we, are we are obviously more prone to open up uh, uh, our company to, to, to women, I think that for us it's not a problem, because f for me, a man, a, man, a man or a woman is exactly the same. So I don't really have this problem because for me it would be natural to judge a person um, based on, 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 uh, on his resume, on, uh, on his skills. But uh, I think that we start from a weak point because, uh, for instance, uh, in a lot of companies, not in mine, but in a lot of companies, that uh, already all the female part, they doesn't have shares, but the male part have shares. So, so this uh, makes it very difficult for a uh, woman to enter in the company. This is obviously a thing that, uh, I, I mean, now belongs to the, to, the, to the history, I would say, but uh, it's a problem that, we, that a lot of Italian companies have. Okay, well, thank you. That, that sounded very honest and, and uh, interesting to me. If yes. I, if I can add just uh, a small point, I think we, we, but we see also more and more uh, women on the ships on board. Uh, and I think that's a good, it could be a good starting point then to see, to give them possibility then to, to, to further um, uh, continue their careers in the office. Uh, uh, we, we, for example, we had on, on, on some chemical ships that we, we used to, to own some um, uh, female captains uh, from, from the north uh, Europe. And uh, so maybe the industry is not, or in the past was not too keen to, 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 to have a uh, woman into the industry, but I think this is uh, coming more and more, also not, not, also, not, not only in the offices, but, but also on, on board the ships. And, and, and you see that more and more. So I think that, that will change possibly and, and you will see not only into the board of directors but also in, then in, in the offices and working, we, we will be seeing more and more women. Andrea, do you yes, have a view uh, on this? I personally believe that uh, uh, the ladies are very, very also performing into the shipping industry, uh, also in the offices. Uh, I, I am a ship owner, but I have also a small worker in company, so half of the people I speak to are ladies and are very, very smart, and I found uh, very, very um, uh, you know, prepared, especially on the chartering side. Uh, many of them uh, led, uh, you know, lead, uh, lead uh, entire companies, so I believe that basically, basically is the same. Uh, with a great pleasure also, I see the uh, University of uh, Engineering, Naval Architecture, which is, uh, uh, you know, full of, uh, of, uh, of ladies now, and uh, uh, they are very, uh, very prepared also when they go on board for inspections, so it's uh, very frequent to, to, to meet ladies uh, during some inspections on board, so um, I think they, they it's basically becoming, uh, uh, you know, very, very frequently that, that you see ladies also leading important companies. Okay, thank you very much. Did, did, was there some suggestion <laughs> that Valeria was going to join us? Or? Well, I think, I think she paid attention to your book title. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She was a bit late. Right. But um, uh, Yanis, do you want to yeah, say a word? Terry, I did, I did want a part to ask the question, of course, also to say that I have the luck to, to <laughs> spend some time with Mariella Bottiglieri, who is a member of, your, of the Neapolitan community and obviously a, a lady and she's on the board of the UK Defence Club along with me and uh, I, I have to say that everyone on the board you know thinks that Mariella's contributions are very much very much to the point and um, she displays a lot of you know both professional understanding on the chartering 
side, but also a lot of the maturity that comes from coming from a family business. And you know, I want you know, to say that this is a typical example. We don't have too many women on the board there. Uh, there is also the daughter of Panos Laskaridis. But um, I think it's, it's important to be extrovert. And uh, you know, uh, I recommend to you also to try to be involved in uh, outside of, of, of Italy and to follow this very good uh, example because that's how you gain uh, the, the respect, you know, not to do it um, in secret. Anyway, I wanted to ask you um, how difficult it is to change the way things are working. Um, you know, we heard yesterday from Mr. Liras about the proprietary model of shipping, where the owner and the manager is together, and this is a modus operandi that becomes a modus vivendi, and it's even more difficult to change a modus vivendi than a modus operandi. So how, how, what ingredient or what aspect would any of you like to highlight as a good way to introduce new thought and new priorities in a, in a family business? We don't need to change everything at once, one step at a time. So maybe we can hear from the young ship owners first. You know, I think that's more or less like the issue that we have for between women and men. Uh, I think that, first of all, we have to start to think that there is no distinction. There is not a women issue or a men issue. There is no a young issue or an or, or, or older uh, issue. I think that we are all human beings, and I think that we have simply we have a different uh, uh, mentality. Oh, obviously, uh, um, a younger is more leaded by his enthusiasm, by his optimism. Uh, maybe he's also a little bit naive, uh, but uh, at the end, it's a very important component of uh, uh, of uh, of, um, of a company. I think that being young is uh, first of all a status a status of mind. I know. I mean, our uh, the president of our company, that is Giovanni Madelpiana, is a, a man of 81 years old, but he's a lot younger from a lot of other people that I know in, a, okay. in, uh, uh, in our company that's, that is uh, maybe uh, 14. Then, for instance, uh, we um, in Confitarma, we are fully involved uh, with the senior. And I think that there is a great exchange of uh, ideas, obviously in the full respect uh, of the experience, because the, the experience is a very important part of our job. But uh, we are basically, we cover a lot of position uh, next, to the, uh, next, to the, next to the older. And this is also fundamental to, um, to uh, make a kind of path in order to be, you know, uh, old ship owners. Then I think that being younger or being older is uh, uh, is more really a status of mind, so it doesn't depend. So, uh, we, in our, in our, uh, in the uh, um, young Italian ship owner, we, uh, I am 37, we have people of 22. Then we have already a kind of gap between myself and, uh, and the youngest. And obviously, obviously that they try to um, uh, put the youngest in some project that are more suited for their mind. But at the end, I think that we are part of the same game, we are playing in the same league, and we, have all, and we are all the same target. So I think that, uh, first of all, uh, to face this problem of being too young, being too old, uh, is start to forget about, about, uh, uh, about this distinction and, and, uh, and try to judge every single person, like the women and the men. There is, uh, women that are very good uh, in, in doing shipping, there is men that are very good in doing shipping and, uh, and, uh, and, okay. and all the way around. So ideas don't have a sex and they don't have an age. They're, yes. they're an idea, they're a mind. But ca can I ask something specific? Because we are in danger of being too uh, positive and too pacifist about the, the way that we view things. I want to ask you from your personal experience, what happened to you in your life when you got involved for the first time in this business from each one of you, one experience of something that you felt was too backward looking or something that you really wanted to change or something that you couldn't understand why it was that way. So I will, I will uh, talk about something which is uh, a little bit different okay. in this sense because uh, we uh, were talking before about uh, the young people that are basically in the front line of the shipping companies because of sometimes of their attitude towards the technologies because they speak foreign languages, uh, whatever. But uh, uh, what I'm feeling, it's my experience, I'm living now, 
is that uh, uh, independently if you are young or if you are uh, uh, old, uh, we are assisting to something that uh, has never been seen before in this world. So daily we face what uh, is going to happen together, the young generation and the old generation, because there is really nothing in the past that could recall what's happening today, and nobody can predict what, what's happening. We are living in, uh, in a turbulence and in a world which changes so fast that not even the young can understand uh, actually rapidly what, what is going to happen. Uh, think about, for example, the, uh, the new regulations that uh, will come into force and are coming into force on the ships. Uh, the life, uh, for example, uh, we will speak also later maybe about uh, ballast water, about uh, you know, the, the, the bunker, uh, the fuel. Think about the fuel, for example. Uh, all the world should comply with 0.5% zero or 0 .5, uh, percent of sulfur cap uh, for the fuel. Nobody is prepared because simply uh, there is a lack of the, of the main information. How much does it cost? Uh, will, be, will cost the fuel with 0.5 sulfur? You know? And so if you don't know that, it's even difficult to know whether to uh, uh, apply for a scrubber strategy or to use a fuel. And this is uh, something that can change your company forever, especially if you are a small company. It seems to me like uh, when uh, there is a black cloud over the, uh, the Grand Prix in Formula One and you have to decide whether to put the, 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 the tire rain for the tires, rain or yeah. not. And uh, this, uh, this can change your strategy for the specific run. Uh, the, a wrong choice, in, uh, for example, in the bunker uh, strategy uh, can uh, bring to a disaster you know, for the whole uh, company that uh, goes uh, ahead for generations. Think about uh, the competitors in this, uh, in this field, uh, of, uh, in the sector of shipping. Uh, nobody 20 years ago thought a competitor could be a bank, could be a pure uh, investor, a KJ owned by a uh, Norwegian dentist or something like that. So uh, it's something which is new for my father, but it's something which is new for me as well. So uh, what we are doing in my personal experience is uh, a purely you know, strong and tight confrontation daily about uh, what is the right uh, choice to, uh, to, to take. And uh, what we fear uh, a lot in this world is that uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a different plan between uh, where to take decision between a family company and uh, let's say um, investors uh, owned company and whatever because uh, uh, we risk our capital, we risk our history, we risk our tradition. Uh, on the other side we see managers of uh, you know, investors that push us to buy vessels over vessels so uh, we feel to stay stuck you know, not buying anything, not growing like the others but uh, it's the only way we should, uh, we should do to, to resist, you know, to do just little step by step and try to minimize the risk. But once again, you know, I, I, I cannot say that the young uh, can be the key for the future of the, of the shipping, as well as the old, the experience of the old. The mix-up of the two things can bring to something which makes sense. So, Andre, in a way, what you're saying is there's not so much a difference within a company between the generations, yeah. but there is between companies, depending if it is the old model, or the new model, there is a the bigger model, distinction which there. Sometimes affect uh, this this market, okay. but basically, I can say that uh, from my experience, uh, that neither the young nor the old can really perfectly understand what is happening today. And from the rest of the panel, has there been something in your first steps in the shipping industry that really stuck to your mind as being too conservative or not appropriate for today's world, or something that you would like in particular to change? Uh, as Terry said at the beginning, I uh, pursued an MBA full time, <laughs> one year full time in Lewis, and I attended a lot of uh, lessons about uh, innovation, disruptive technologies, uh, and uh, flat organization. And then you face reality uh, when you came back to your office. You have a shipping company uh, that is uh, not really flexible, and uh, there are hierarchies, and you cannot ignore it. And so the challenge, I think, in this industry is um, to mix up <coughs> tradition and innovation uh, without exaggerating not in one side and not in the other. And uh, from mm. a younger point of view, can be maybe more mm, difficult because uh, you're maybe more proactive uh, for uh, innovations and you want to introduce uh, new things, but I think that uh, in this industry, nothing, mm, not everything is possible because uh, even investments are long-term, uh, capital intense, uh, and so uh, things have to change, but uh, 
not the, the, the industry is not able to change as fast as others. So an example of an innovation that you felt was difficult to implement uh, or that you would example, have liked? Also in, in the IT, for example, uh, you can do amazing things in an office and then you have to face difficulties uh, on a ship because uh, it's not that easy to change uh, an IT system on a ship that maybe is not uh, a new building and uh, maybe also an investment. You have to think, okay, I'm doing this investment on a ship that maybe has got uh, five years of life left. So uh, you there, have to be wise. There are certain structural elements in shipping that perhaps do not allow a uniform um, evolution on the technology side. And in the chartering business? Connected to what Andrea was, was mentioning before, I think that I mean these these big changes which we are facing, uh, loss of a cap, for example. Uh, I fully agree with Andrea that it's it's a combination of things. I mean, it's it's both the younger and and the older generation who have to tackle it and and, and understand it with the experience of, of the the older generation. But we, I think, those problems have to be. We, from the younger generation, we have to, to, to cope with them. We have, we, we, it's us who, who need to understand them and, and try to, to bring the, good solu the, the right solution. Uh, loss of a cap, as we said, is, it's already basically done. I mean, everybody has done his decision, probably, the scrubber, no scrubbers. And we said yesterday that it's, it's only a temporary solution. We, we should be looking already at, at the next uh, changes, next innovations, uh, which will eat us, and, and for sure it will be us here taking then that decision because our parents will probably not uh, I mean they, they would expect at least that it, w it will be coming from us so so I think we have to to um, uh, for example use Confitarma to, to gather together to get the information uh, understand what could be the possible solutions uh, talk with the with um, IMO and other association to understand how we can because again as, as we said before we family business, we, we own the ships, we operate the ships, then we take the, respons the full responsibility of what we are doing and the decision we are making. And of course, they can be very expensive. Uh, Andrea was making the distinction between investors, uh, uh, companies, or, 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 and, and, uh, and the family business. Um, and again, it's, it's a lot of money. It, these, these things are expensive, so we, we have to make sure that we make the right decisions when we take them. Uh, today we don't have the full answer, so it's 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 tough on us. It's difficult for us because we said yesterday that we y you don't know still if if Scrubber will be the solution. If you can then, uh, if I IFO will be available. Uh, if you don't put the Scrubbers, you don't know then if you will be you will be finding the the, the, the right um, compliant fuel. So um, so I think we have to to be enthusiastic about what we do. It's a fascinating industry. We like it, but we have to. To, to, to keep up with it and, and I think new ideas and, and new uh, uh, problem solving should be coming from us for the future. Yanni, uh, sorry, if please, I may please. add some things. Uh, thinking twice to your question, you know what is very, it, uh, we have this project and I know because there is some member of Varsila here, of this hybrid tag. That is okay. a new generation of tag, we are tag owner basically. Okay. So uh, the hybrid tag, it's a tag that basically works uh, through normal MGO, but also through battery. Uh, and uh, it was quite funny because uh, the oldest generation of our company that is still involved uh, in, the, in, the, in the decision making, they were quite against this project. And they are the same generation that basically was in charge when we make the passage from coil to MGO, you know? So, I mean, it was uh, incredible uh, how you can forget some lesson, how you can lose your enthusiasm. Maybe the battery was not a good choice, I have no idea. Maybe in the future, and I'm sure, in order also to assure Gian Mario that is here because we work with him uh, from Barzilla, uh, maybe it will be the next step. But the first reaction was uh, pessimistic, you know. And I think that uh, is the same reaction that uh, the, uh, the uh, older generation of the old generation that we have today had uh, when they proposed the passage, the passage from uh, um, call to MGO, you know? Yeah. So this is something that uh, uh, it's quite strange to me. Yeah, if I can add, uh, hello? Uh, Andrea? If I can add something, you know, to the discussion of before, uh, is uh, what, uh, given uh, the assumption of what is the world today, which is very difficult for the young and for the old, 
what uh, we as a young can uh, bring into our companies that can, uh, you know, can be seen as an advantage. It's a matter of fact that today the vessels uh, uh, have a very short life and also they are more expensive and uh, also there, there are new changes in regulation uh, coming into force or already came in force uh, which makes the vessel even more expensive. And so the, the nature of the ship owner itself changes. Change it. Before the ship owners was uh, uh, focused mainly on gathering and catching cargoes, and no matter how was the ship you were using to to, to transport the, that that cargo from A to B or catching contracts, uh, I dare say that before uh, uh, the best ship owner actually was the one able to manage old vessel, new vessel, all type of vessels, uh, and was the carrier. Today there is so much attention on the ship. That means that uh, we can focus on less investments, and we uh, have to gather more money to go ahead with our company. So what uh, our generation can bring and we are trying to do is to be more open-minded towards investment of third parties into other companies, for example, or to put uh, on the center of our you know, business the management of our company rather than uh, the ownership of a vessel. So maybe one day I see companies led by our generation uh, owning maybe three vessel 100%, uh, two vessel 50% uh, with others, 30% uh, of another vessel, put the know-how uh, at the center of the scene of, the, of, of your operation. And this can be an advantage. Also, uh, uh, the most difficult thing which we are trying to do and uh, uh, gives a lot of help of what we are doing with our group of young ship owners in Confitagma, uh, by going uh, you know, together, uh, visiting other countries, or uh, studying together by exchanging impressions all the time, and uh, let's say walking together through this storm, is maybe uh, to create uh, such sense of trust between ourselves that can lead to partnerships, uh, which I believe uh, they will be fundamental. We need to understand that the competitors are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the company is not the company of your neighbor, of your friend, uh, but uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, some completely different companies some coming from other in China, background of other countries. So Wall we need Street. to gather together and we need to share our uh, competence, maybe also forming, you know, like kind of aggregation or partnership. Uh, uh, my personal experience, for example, was a uh, few years ago to establish a, a small brokering company. And I work with many of my friends uh, as uh, they were the vessel was mine. Uh, and it's not only to make money on that business, but also to grow together on certain projects. If I cannot put the vessel, I can put my knowledge, I can put the, 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 uh, on, on the table, you know, the, the charter that I know, uh, helping uh, my friend to, 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 to charter a vessel, hoping that the next time would be the same, uh, you know, at the opposite. Uh, we are trying uh, something which uh, probably our um, you know fathers uh, they couldn't do you know to be happy if some of your uh, you know competitor also grows because that means uh, to have uh, you know more trust uh, from the banks uh, that the segment is growing uh, you know independently if it is you or another and, uh, bring uh, positive uh, you know energy to to, the, to this to this field it's not easy because we come all from uh, company family companies existing for generations and so, you know, it's very, very difficult to uh, change our mentality. Also for me that I'm speaking about that, it's not easy, but really, really we are putting all our effort uh, to make this happen, uh, you know, very shortly. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. One, one of the issues um, that came up yesterday to, 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 to um, kind of uh, bookend the whole thing, it seemed to me, was the inability of the industry, the shipping industry generally, to communicate with the outside world. And this had been a serious problem. And with issues like the move that you talked about, Giacomo, to, to, to um, f away from an oil-based um, economy to, to a sort of cleaner fuels, um, shipping actually is going through a very, very traumatic period. It's very condensed. We know about the pressures around um, low sulfur fuels and the wider story around decarbonization is equally worrying. There's a lack of public sympathy for shipping, I think, and, and the elder generation has, has let that slip in many ways. It's just got on with its business. I wonder whether you, um, this generation has got an opportunity to do something different and really um, communicate with the public at large as well as policymakers around what a vital role this industry plays and how extraordinarily important it is to world trade. 
I, I wonder whether you have any ideas about how that vision can be communicated from now on to help the industry help itself. Um, uh, can I start with you, um, uh, Maria Laro? The yes. boys, again, are, are falling into a pattern of talking a lot, um, <laughs> and, and it, it's nice to, to uh, allow your voice to, to see through. Yeah, uh, I think that, uh, yes, through the, the industry, the shipping industry, uh, it's, uh, it's really closed. And um, people usually don't want to disclose uh, information, and there is a uh, general feeling about the, the difficult of doing benchmarking uh, in our industry is, uh, is increasing. And, uh, and it's funny because actually, uh, technologies and communication uh, skills are increasing, so they are not going in the same in the same way. Uh, but I think that uh, we, as a young generation, uh, our networking as an association is is helping a lot uh, in uh, breaking the wall uh, about this topic, uh, at least inside our own country because we are an association of uh, Italy. And this is why we were also working on uh, trying to build a young ship owner association in Europe. Because uh, we saw that in, uh, in our group, uh, this kind of, uh, um, also these panels uh, or uh, conferences, uh, uh, our <coughs> meetings uh, are helping uh, to, to dislock these, uh, these barriers in, in our industry. Uh, Filippo. Yeah. Um, I think you're perfectly right. I mean, we, we, saw, it, we saw yesterday, it's, it's this, the industry is quite invisible uh, until you get the disaster in the middle of the ocean and, and, and there's a, a collision or, or, or something else. It only gets to the news when it's bad news normally. And, uh, and that's, but it's quite difficult to change that, I agree, but I also agree that it has to come from us. I mean, th there's no way that uh, our parents or our, uh, the older generation will, will uh, try to do something about this. Um, I think everybody on his, mm, on his little, uh, in, in his company can do a few small things, which are, if you think about it, I think most of, or I wouldn't say most of, but you s we, s you s we still see a lot of uh, companies not having a website. Uh, and, and that's something that, for example, the case of myself and Giacomo, we, we decided a couple of years ago to mm, review a bit our marketing, if you can call it marketing. Uh, of course, this applies a bit better to the harbor tags, which are more visible and uh, to the public uh, rather than maybe uh, bulkers. Uh, but, but we did a bit of um, efforts in that, uh, reviewing our website, updating it. And, and to give you a short example, it, I mean, paid off. I mean, it, we had, uh, it was more attractive. We, we got, it was, of course, bedtime for offshore industry. And we got contacted through the website by, by, uh, by um, uh, a filmmaker, producer who wanted, we needed an uh, anchor handler to, do, to shoot a movie. Uh, so then the, the, the tag was, was uh, sort of fixed charted for, for a couple of months to, 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 to do a movie on it. And, uh, and that's only a thing because it was, it, was, it was seen on the website and it was available to the public because otherwise there's no way that, that of course, you, 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 uh, they would have picked and they would have seen on the website the, the picture of the, of the anchor render. So uh, I, thi I think, yes, that there's, it's still an industry which is not sort of attracting to the, to the public, is not seen, is not uh, visible. Uh, I think slowly, slowly, everybody can, can do his own uh, lit little, little thing. And then, as Marilla was saying, within Confitarma, within, within the industry, uh, tr try to get it a bit more uh, seen, uh, even though it's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's still an industry which is not, uh, again, it's, not, it's a service and it's, it's not easy to do so. Thank you very much. Giacomo, do you have a view on this? Uh, I don't have a lot of head because, uh, uh, to be honest, it, what uh, it has been said, I think that it's more than enough, but I would like to say that communication is the key, especially because uh, the image that the ship owner has is not a, um, something it's not a good one you know we are uh, we are uh, we are uh, um, um, the, 
the public, the audience thinks that that basically we are we, we are all uh, uh, all rich. We don't pay our tax for the tonnage tax and all this stuff, and they don't look at what we are doing every day. They don't look um, of uh, all the efforts that every single company is doing, uh, not only in order to maintain uh, um, uh, uh, its company and uh, all the employees and all the occupation, but also for the uh, environment. I think that what the shipping community is doing now, and now I'm, for instance, I would like to mention the Sulfur Cup, to the environment is incredible. And I don't know how many other industries are doing the same, especially in a moment where the shipping is suffering a lot. Basically, IMO, and I think that that it's more than fair, is asking to comply with some, with, with some regulation, with investing a lot of money, scrubbers or not scrubbers, buying MGO instead of, 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 of IFO, in a moment of the industry that is extremely difficult. Because nowadays, maybe except of cruising, there is no HCP segment that is gaining money. Because dry, liquid, offshore, basically they are all losing money. and. Uh, the uh, world community today is asking us uh, to invest money in order to be uh, greener. This is, it's a commitment that I think that all the ship owners are very happy to, 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 to comply it, but I think that our obligation is to communicate it. When, uh, for instance, there is, uh, the, here there, is, uh, lo, um, there was Lorenzo Matacena speaking about the first L, uh, 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 LNG failures, he has to communicate it. He, he did it, but I think that this is this incredible effort that its company, that is still a family company, is doing and is doing basically uh, for the for the for the for the community because nobody pay a higher tariff to take this ferry because it's uh, uh, green powered. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I would like to say something uh, uh, you know strange about this information in this uh, new uh, era. Uh, what is happening with the globalization, uh, which is something that uh, scares us a lot as ship owners, is that uh, everyone knows the same thing at the same time, but nobody knows what the, the others are doing at the same time. And this is, I, I can make an, an example. Uh, if you uh, have to plan an investment, uh, think always about the family company, uh, very slow into moving, you receive the brokers in your, uh, in your office and the brokers say, you know, go to this vessel, this is a vessel of the future. There are only 30 vessels in the world that build uh, so far and uh, the order book is a very low, whatever, and convince you. Uh, the process of convincing uh, a traditional ship owner to make an investment, to put all his money into a new, uh, you know, um, uh, in a project, is, is very slow. So you speak about uh, this with your partners, with your father, within the company, technically speaking, whatever it takes time. And when you decided to place finally the order, it's something that makes you very proud. Uh, you know, with your family, you may maybe have a dinner or you say, oh, wow, we change, we will change uh, the future of our company. We are very uh, modern now, you know, we invested in uh, the, the, the ship of our dreams uh, and the trade winds uh, published the day after that uh, Scorpio has bought a 50 vessel of this type uh, and I don't know other big uh, players uh, 100 vessel uh, the investment and so you the, the niche uh, that of your dream is already fulfilled before starting uh, this is something which uh, is very frustrating for us because uh, you know it's one of the luck, uh, big luck, uh, big bugs of the, the globalization. You know where uh, every you know also the small owner uh, seems to have enhanced the, the project of the life. Uh, but this is because the the, the you know the, the role of the ship owner changes. Uh, when uh, sometimes I speak, for example, with Maria Laura about, uh, about uh, the grandfather, he, she, she, she always tell me that uh, uh, going uh, at uh, dinner, you know, maybe on Sunday, he found the grandfather, you know, drawing uh, the, 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 the silhouette of the ship, you know, of, of his dream, and he was not a naval architect. So this kind of uh, uh, view of the ship owner, unfortunately, is something that we lack a lot. You know, the strategy view of the ship owner. The vessels are all the same for everyone, and so who has more money and the scale economies are pre prevalent to, to all other, you know, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, personal uh, strategy on the business. Maybe some of the niche business are, uh, you know, prevented for this, like the rural parks or the offshore in certain niches. Uh, uh, we are, for example, involved in offshore and bunkering, which are two niches. So you can still have your own uh, strategy, whether to go with one engine or twin screw or whatever, you know, would be the design of the, the length of the vessel because it's Port has his own, uh, you know, difficulties. But in a traditional uh, Trump uh, vessels like Balkan uh, and tankers, is a very, very tough. So this is I wanted to. Okay, that's an interesting point. Uh, if, I mean, if I might just pick up on what Andrea said, just to confirm that this sort of uh, existential question 
is echo also in Greece, where there is a lot of you know, medium-sized company and it's very hard to define your position when the world has changed so fast. It's very difficult to catch up with people that don't care so much how reckless they are because somebody else can pick up the damage or because the damage is instantly recapitalized and we heard yesterday, it was interesting on yesterday's panel, two very big owners, your own uh, Emmanuel Grimaldi and our Panos Lascarides, they have banks calling them up, offering money at, you know, we heard 1%, which is incredibly competitive pricing, much better than the public companies. And then we hear all the medium-sized owners, they're basically shut out of the market because they don't have a unified balance sheet or because they're not able to keep restructuring all the time. So it seems that the competition, it's not very level. And I think it's correct. And maybe the young, younger generation can come up with slightly different models to compete. Because in, um, in ancient Greek dialogue of Protagoras, you need to be faster than whoever is stronger or stronger than whoever is faster. You cannot be the strongest and the fastest at the same time. So it seems this is a, a difficult choice to make. And maybe, Terry, you can pick up on mm. uh, some things that might be a good lead, mm. a good tip for yeah. people in this strange world <laughs> you're moving towards. Uh, yes, no, I'll have to, I'll have to have a think about that. I, what, what I was interested in is, um, uh, you're all part of family shipping um, groups, so you have a, a sort of obvious, you, you'll have heard about it around the dinner table, um, about shipping, it will have been very much part of your lives. To people outside of um, that world, up till now, how, how do you attract those? If this industry is going to be, um, continue to be important, and we heard from Roberto Fico yesterday that the, the um, you know, important politicians like himself at least claim to be extremely interested and, and see shipping and the maritime industries as being very important for Italy. But if that is going to continue, and if that is going to grow, it's absolutely essential that young, very clever people are brought into the industry. And I just wondered what your experience was of people not inside the family, not those with a lot of experience of the maritime world, but those outside. H how easy is it going to be? How your dialogue with your friends outside the industry, to what extent do they understand shipping, see it as negative, see it full of rich people and nothing else, or see it bad for the environment, or just badly paid? How do you, you know, why not go and work for Goldman Sachs? Why go and work for a shipping company when we all know that the, the finances are rocky? Uh, any, any views on, on how to attract that talent and what your dialogue with your friends is like? I think it's, um, we go back to the to an industry being not visible to the public. Many, uh, I mean, to my experience, talking with my friends, <coughs> they don't know, you don't think about, uh, yes, right, you have a Panamax or an oil tanker bringing oil or, 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 or grain from one port to the other, and, and they, even physically, they, they, it's tough to imagine a ship, how it is done and so on. So, but I think then once you, you explain them what, what is your role in the company, what you do, they, they, I think it's a fascinating industry and they, 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 they like it and they understand. I mean, also maybe for us being in a family business, we sort of, I think every one of us sees a bit of the, the company at 360 degrees. So we see from, from the crew management to the operations, to the commercial, to chartering, to the S&P. So talking about this to, to our friends or external guys, not, not in the industry, uh, I think they realize, all oh, right, there is also this type of business which maybe we don't think about. And, uh, and I think it's quite, uh, if not attractive, I think it's, it's still, they, they, they get interest and they, they, they like to try to understand a bit more about what we do. Uh, and I wouldn't say in a negative way. I think that they, uh, well, of course, then in, in, in Italy, shipping is a, is a, is a big, uh, big, big industry, so everybody knows uh, but um, 
but I think they, it's, it's, a, it's fascinating and the, it's attractive and uh, they, but still I see many people not uh, exactly imagine what we are doing in the office every day and not uh, sort of, if you're not telling them what exactly we are doing, they, they, they still have this external view and then they don't realize exactly what is shipping made of at the end. Where are you, Laura? Yes, uh, I am from Parma. And Parma is a city in the middle of Italy without sea. <laughs> so my friends doesn't know anything about shipping. And uh, this is something that uh, when you introduce yourself to someone in your city uh, and you say, yes, I I'm from a shipping company, they, they are always super surprised, more than for a person that is from Naples or Genoa. And, uh, but then, as uh, Filippo was saying, when I start to describe the industry, my company, what we are doing. In the end, I always say, uh, we're tr we are transporting fuel. So I say, how is your car working? So even you, that you don't know anything about shipping, and you feel yourself uh, so far away from the industry, even you are using something that maybe was on one of our ship. So it's something that uh, it seems very far away, at the same time, uh, probably these chairs were uh, transported by sea. Yeah. And uh, so um, in the end, when you start speaking about uh, even your passion, then it's very fascinating. And I think that this, this is a key point that can be used uh, to, to break down the wall about communication, because people actually are interested in, uh, in this industry. It's something that it is not perceived, but when they start to, to listen to you, then uh, they are interested, and uh, it's a fascinating industry. Mm, thank you. Um, got any views, Andrea? I'm sure you have. Yes, I, uh, <laughs> yes you, you said before, uh, you know, and I per totally agree that shipping is so important you know, for the life of a country. I uh, think that 90% of the goods in the world are moved by vessels. And uh, not only, you know, economically speaking, but also for tourism, for the culture. The culture come from from the sea. We, you know, we are uh, we live in Napoli, where we we had several dominations, and we have all these beauties also because uh, some of them were brought by the sea. And also, you know, it's uh, it's so important even for a war, for example, you know, to have own fleet. So the government should protect and defend the shipping industry. Then uh, the, the image of the ship owner outside uh, will change. Uh, as I was telling before, like uh, the world is changing also, this image will change. Now, um, till 20 years ago, it was seen uh, the ship owner mainly as a character of a book, a nice book, like, uh, you know, the Comandante Lauro, you know, Onassis in Greece, you know, like uh, the rich man uh, uh, going uh, to beautiful parties and whatever. Uh, this image is, uh, is changing and have to change. What we are doing as a young, uh, for example, in our uh, meetings, uh, in our um, convention that we do within, uh, within ourselves, we try to have a, a kind of a meritocracy. So we try to invite uh, more and uh, listen more to the skilled guy within the company, which is not uh, uh, necessarily you know, the son of the ship owner or the ship owner itself, but is a, a young guy working in this industry. So we are promoting uh, the, the, the shipping uh, uh, among the, the schools and the universities, uh, uh, organizing masters. Uh, Giacomo, for example, will probably talk about this later because he's very, very skilled in uh, promoting the, the shipping industry between the young generations. They created several projects also with their company together with Filippo. They invite students uh, on board vessels. Uh, they make understand that uh, shipping uh, can be related to, uh, to a single man or a single ship owner, but it's something which probably will disappear. It's a teamwork. And so it's a work like another work. If we go to Asia, if you go to the Middle East, uh, you, you always find uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the very young people, uh, ladies or men working in chartering, for example, department, uh, uh, which are very, uh, let's say, pass me the term, normal. You know, in Italy, uh, uh, until 20 years ago, if you are a chartering man, you dress with a tailored uh, you know, suit, uh, with a cigar or something like that. Yeah. It will completely change. Mm -hmm. Uh, the importance is what you do, not what, uh, you, how you appear you know, in this business. Uh, but uh, Giacomo can t speak very widely about, uh, about this. Uh, no, I mean, I think that, that <laughs> communication is, is very important. And because we are part of the industry, and especially in Italy, we are part of the country. For instance, we, being uh, owner of tags, 
in Genoa, we are part of the city because we serve the harbor of Genoa and the harbor of Genoa and Genoa is the same things basically. So we, so we provide a service to the Genoese co uh, community. And once I was in the ferry with a friend of mine, uh, with a ferry going, uh, uh, going to Sardinia, I will not say which, which, which ferry, you know. Uh, and uh, um, uh, fr this friend of mine from Milan told me, oh, okay, this is one of your tax. Yes, it is. How is below the waterline? So he didn't know nothing about the ship. He, he, the yeah, I mean, he didn't know nothing about uh, the shape of the hull, the propellers, wh where they are, or all this stuff. And then we, as the Mercator Uniti with, uh, with Filippo, we start, uh, for instance, an Instagram channel. That can be very stupid things, but uh, at the end we have more than 80,000 followers that for a Genoese company shipping is a lot, especially if you compare with other shipping reality bigger than us. And uh, we found that uh, uh, the citizen has a lot of interest in, in shipping. They want to know more. Then we, uh, we organize visit uh, on, uh, on the ship. We try to open up a little bit our company to the public because especially in the harbor to watch business, you are part of the city. In, in Italy, the harbor to watch system is a public service. Being a public service, your users, not the uh, shipping owners, is the, is the community. Then at the end of the day, you, you have the obligation to let uh, the other understand what you're doing every day and then uh, which uh, tools you use in order to serve their needs. Then I think that also, as I said before, open up our industry a little bit more to the community. Understand that uh, every T-shirt that we wear is coming, the 97% of these T-shirts coming through ships. It's important. Thank you very much, Giancomo. Can I move on to something else um, in the closing minutes? Um, mentoring. I mean, uh, my experience, my personal experience in journalism was that, that I, I progressed partly because I found people who kind of looked after me, however, however enthusiastic, uh, determined, and however much one felt an equal of anyone around you. And, and I agree, Giacomo, it's a lovely truth that actually you are as young or as old as you want to be. And I meet young um, people who strike me as, <laughs> as positively ancient. And I meet um, uh, uh, people even older than myself who, who have a, a youthful vigor and an open mind that, that is very inspiring and, in, and um, encouraging. Terry, are you thinking of Francesco here? I am actually. <laughs> Francesco is one of those people. Who, who, who Francesco is definitely one of those people who, 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 who is ageless in terms of his passion and enthusiasm. But, but I personally, there were people um, in, in my professional life who were kind of older figures who kind of showed me the ropes in a way, and I wonder whether, you, whether that is something you feel is happening. I think particularly with women, uh, you know, it, it's inevitable because of, of, of the position of women being permanently in a minority that there's that kind of lack of confidence. Um, you look at the board and you see all these men, it, 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 can't, it, it, it can't help. And so you do need people to, to stand on your side and make you feel totally 100% worthy. And I wondered whether there was, a, the, there was already mentoring in your companies. And if there isn't, is that something that's just my view? Or do you think there's something in that? Um, yes, please, uh, Maria Laura again. You know, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's always difficult to be young. Also, if you are very positive, uh, if uh, you uh, have a lot of passion, uh, always you need to have the backup of some uh, um, or, I mean, uh, some some person belonging to the old generation to back you up, because at the end alone it's impossible. I think that you need al always to have a mentor, and I think that it's very difficult to meet this kind of people uh, in the company. I think that you can count them from the uh, fr uh, um, uh, with the with the with with the finger of your hand, Be but uh, when you but uh, I think that this is the people that you will remember for all your career, especially when you get older and older. I, uh, I think that this kind of people, I think that you mentioned Francesco, I don't know Francesco so well, but the simple fact that Francesco let us speak for one hour 
and uh, <laughs> I think that also between the audience, there is a lot of these people because if these people listen to us for one hour, it seems that uh, they 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 care about about uh, uh, about about the younger because you can have all the enthusiasm that you want. I think that the young that that that, that the youngers will change the world, and this is, will be. Uh, through also when I will be old, and, and, and I hope that I will remember my speech w when I will be older. Um, but uh, uh, I think that you always need of, in your life of four or five persons that basically guide you yeah. in order to help you in this, uh, in this industry that is, uh, we have to be honest, is one of the most difficult industries in the world. And this is the reason why, and I'm trying to reconnect to the fact that I said before, uh, we have to communicate our business and our, and our values because we are not producing shoes. We are doing shipping, and shipping is a wonderful world. So we, we have the obligation to communicate. This gives us passion. We are young, we have to communicate this passion, but at the end, as I said before, we need uh, four or five people. You always need, but not only in your, in your working career, also in your life, you always need four or five key persons that help you out to, 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 to be the man that, that you want to be. Uh, Maria Laura. I agree with uh, with Giacomo, um, even because uh, shipping, when you do shipping, shipping has a wide uh, horizon, so you cannot uh, be able to know everything about everything. And uh, so you have to rely on people, and um, not only people from your family, uh, because I think it's not, uh, it's not, uh, um, healthy for the company uh, because people that are coming from outside they are giving you uh, a, a good uh, new uh, point of view and uh, it's something that can help co communication between companies because uh, the because the shipping is a small yes, that's, sector that's how many people are always the same so you can exchange your point of view even with someone that is not in from your company and is uh, joining your company and is uh, bringing with him uh, something that maybe you were not able to see and maybe was already there <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a good uh, good way to to make the know-how uh, going through the the industry thank you Filippo, do you want to yeah, say anything? I think this is um, of course this is a process which which needs to be planned uh, and this, I think, needs to be coming from the top management and the older generations, the mentoring process of introducing, especially in family business, in introducing the, the, the younger generation to the business. Uh, we said about many things which have to be brought up by, by us, the younger. I think this, this process has to come from uh, the higher level or the older level, let's say. Um, and I think in Italy, uh, maybe we're a bit behind in that process compared to the rest of Europe or, or, or rest of the world. I mean, uh, we, we travel a lot, we see a lot of, at our age, we see a lot of um, uh, guys from our age having already top level position in, in, in other companies, in their own companies or, or family businesses. Uh, Wheels, I think it's a cultural thing, of course, in Italy maybe, maybe uh, we're a bit behind on this. But again, I think this is a, a process which has to be well planned because because uh, it's a long process. It's not like you went into the family business knowing nothing and you get to uh, whatever position. I think the, you have to see a bit of everything and, and slowly, slowly start. Uh, mentoring, we have to, you have to have a couple of mentors or one or two which will uh, educate you or let you understand the business. And, and, um, and uh, but again, this has to be well planned in advance, I think. Andrea, do you want a quick word? Because we're running out of time, actually. Yes, I perfectly agree with, uh, with everyone, you know, uh, when they say that, uh, you know, we have to rely on, uh, on our, um, you know, people working with us uh, independently if they are a son or uh, relatives of the ship owner or not. And especially that, but, but at the end of the day, the, the, the firm is made up uh, by, by, by persons, by people. So, you know, this, uh, this is, should be very, very clear understanding to everyone that uh, wants to, you know, go and work in, into, a, into the shipping industry. Uh, the shipping industry is also very particular because of its dynam dynamic uh, factor. You know, the vessel uh, is going through the ocean, so everything can happen. Uh, we can have uh, some unforeseen events. Uh, think about the piracy or uh, engine, uh, you know, broken uh, in the middle of the sea. So the life is made up mainly of problems, so you need to interact a lot. 
But what uh, I wanted to say, uh, l mm. linking to something that was said to Terry before about uh, being young, uh, since this is a young session, though I am uh, 40 years old now, <laughs> but uh, I uh, had uh, the honor of being the you know, the president of the Young Ship Owners uh, um, and thus participating uh, uh, also into the executive committee of the old. So I, I were, you know, close by the, the, the best ship owners, Italian ship owners, uh, and that is the chance and the occasion to uh, steal the, the secrets or uh, try to learn from them. And at the end of my experience, what I've learned from them is that they are very, very young inside. Uh, we had uh, the president uh, that uh, was the president of the old when I was president of the young, which is Mr. Grimaldi. I always say, you know, you have hundreds of vessels, uh, but you are still hungry for another and another and another. You know, why don't you, for example, this is what the beginning of my mandate, I say, why don't you, for example, give more time for uh, trips, uh, families, and uh, whatever. I, and you feel in his eyes, you know, the hunger for going ahead and being uh, better than yourself all the time. And I'm sure that uh, with him or other, you know, the executive committee, if I threw out from my bag uh, football, they wanted to participate to a match and win. So this is, uh, we had an uh, example in, uh, in, in our, in our, um, in our um, uh, history, you know, of the Italian uh, ship owning industry, uh, of uh, 95 years old uh, uh, ship owners uh, ordering vessel that probably they had never, never seen. seen, you know, after. So uh, this is, is something that keeps you very young. This, I mean, for being young inside uh, and uh, having, uh, you know, being hungry to do to, to, to better than yourself all the time, even at 90 years old and 95 years old. Okay. And this is a secret to, 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 to live in, the, in this industry uh, for a long time. I believe uh, this is what I learned, yes. Thank you very much. Did you want Terry, to say just that? a closing remark, I think, from a very interesting panel, which seemed to focus more on modernizing the existing process. I, I suspect that in five or ten years, in a similar panel, we will hear about changing a lot more of the concept. And I'm thinking of yesterday, the refiners talking about them going, not caring so much whether they're refining petroleum or biofuel or hydrogen. I'm thinking about Coca-Cola canning cannabis and selling it for a very conservative company that stands for America. That's a very big shift. So these, I haven't seen these yet happening in our industry. I suspect they will come. It could be a shift to the ports. It could be a shift to the cargo. It could be a redefinition of what we're carrying. Maybe we'll be carrying information in satellites. Or maybe it will be, you know, <laughs> in an even greater future, carrying stuff into space. But there is a lot of room for more fundamental innovation in our industry, except for just rejuvenation. And uh, I hope that you are given the chance uh, from people that are obviously showing you a lot of trust to not be afraid to really move forward and redefine some fairly solid concepts because that is really the most important way to make a big, a big change. So thank you and good luck. Thank, yeah, you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much to the, <laughs> thank you very much to the panel. Bravo. Thank you very much, really interesting. Thank you. Now we have uh, the, we did the shipping and uh, I think we had very, very interesting panel um, and uh, now we pass to the law but it's still uh, the law of the shipping <laughs> and I will call, uh, I think the moderator with uh, my friend uh, Federico Deodato on the podium will co-moderate with me the panel and um, I will call Jonathan Lux, Mario Ricomagno, James Bean, 
David Pete Lurch, Mark Clough, and Valeria Novella, who should have been the previous panel uh, since, I mean, she's very young, but uh, she has been uh, president of the Young Ship Owners two presidents ago, before Giacomo and Andrea. She's uh, <laughs> biologically very young, but uh, in some way she will now face the challenge from the law, from the point of view of the, the user of, of the maritime law. So I will ask Valeria, who, uh, who had a phone call for um, a shipping matter, as in our business, uh, this uh, can happen very often, to, to comment and perhaps uh, help Federico and myself at the end to put some question from the side of the ship owner. So please uh, come, join us. Valeria, where would you like to sit? I think next to Federico. Is, or, um, Mario and... I, I sit here, yes. Oh, you, you, you sit here and I sit there, okay? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, we will not introduce uh, longly the, the panelists because I think they, they are well known, but I think the first of them is uh, James Bean. I, he's the presently the head of the Standard P&I Club, but I had the uh, pleasure of uh, working along with him on some cases not in a too distant uh, past. And so I know also what a good lawyer he can be. Uh, and I will leave um, um, uh, uh, to Federico uh, the introduction to and the question to, to James. Microphone, is it working? Yeah, good. So thank you very much, Francesco, for being here. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to apologize. In the last couple of years, I couldn't attend. You know why? We had a little bit of an issue. So here I am again. I have my own punishment, which means I'm surrounded by lawyers. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, but uh, that's my punishment. Thank you very much, Francesco, eh? to, <laughs> to be in this particular panel eh, surrounded by brilliant lawyers. So I will probably not understand the majority of what you're going to say, but that's fine. Uh, I've been able to negotiate with Francesco that I had my own, as discussed yesterday, port of refuge, and that is James. <laughs> James is going to be asked uh, something which is not specifically, specifically um, shipping law. It's more uh, an introduction to the challenges which we are going to see. Are we talking of the Future, future is today, now it's better. And uh, one of the things um, is uh, ITs. What is happening in shipping in respect of ITs? We are, we are hearing every day or reading every, every day of how much influence the new ITs, the new technologies are going to uh, become more and more important in shipping. Uh, the, I think everybody has heard of the, uh, what's wrong, what's wrong? <laughs> has heard of this idea of... Have tried this. Is. No, it's good. <laughs> and um, we have all heard of uh, uh, semi-autonomous ships, autonomous ships. Uh, uh, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? We don't know, but definitely there will be something which is going to go in that direction. So the IT issues and related issues, which may be insurance issues, 
um, which say what's going to happen with this stronger and stronger say presence of uh, IT related issues which we are going to see and uh, clearly don't know say if say there will be legal issues which uh, you can introduce and then perhaps it will become something which we can discuss with our esteemed uh, other panelists okay James what's happening with these autonomous ships is it a worry for an underwriter what are you doing <laughs> well thank you Francesco and thank you Federico for the kind opportunity to come and speak to you all today actually um, I, I feel I should be segueing almost the previous discussion because um, Federico's asked a very broad and wide-ranging uh, question actually which uh, I will try to answer but I think first up from my own personal and professional perspective uh, the earlier discussion and I must applaud the panelists for for the breadth of uh, topics covered and the importance of the issues that they raise within this industry first of all the importance of promoting women within shipping but linked to that encouraging the younger generation to uh, be impassionate be passionate and interested in the, uh, in the world of shipping um, insurance was once described to me uh, by a colleague as the drunk uncle at the party. You know, you're obliged to invite him there. Um, you know, you kind of hope he doesn't make a fool of himself. But you know, once in a while, he's useful. And uh, having myself made the transition from law to insurance, I find that's a little unfair. Mary Laura sort of introduced the fact that she was trying to describe to her friends in Palmer the fact that you know she's in shipping, and you get that blank look. Well, the same is true in insurance, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to bring insurance to life, to encourage the next generation in, because the next generation, in encouraging us a diverse and more inclusive workforce, they are the individuals that are going to be driving this industry forward, whether it's from a shipping perspective or from an insurance perspective. And that really leads me into the topic that I'd like to talk on today, which is technology and shipping. Um, I see, uh, and as was touched on in previous panels, you know, we're at the edge uh, of an exponential increase in technology and shipping. Whether it's disruptive to our business, uh, whether it's going to give rise to new challenges, without question, yes. And from a standard club's perspective, and I think it's true for all these panelists here alongside me, the brilliant lawyers, I, I must say, I've, I, I'm, it's the first time I've ever been put in that category. Uh, but alongside these brilliant legal minds is that as providers of service to the insurance industry, uh, and sorry, as providers of service to the shipping industry, we are all obliged to keep up with the techn technological developments that are happening. Now, I'm pleased to say I can't profess to be an expert in all things technological, but one of the things that we have done at the Standard Club is uh, very early on we set up a technological working group. I'm the oldest member of that group. It consists of uh, guys and girls from the claims and underwriting team, loss prevention and IT, and their watching brief was to advise and uh, report to the management team on what the technological changes are in shipping and how, as insurers, we can keep up to date with that and tailor the product and offering that we provide to that to the industry and really uh, within that it's such a broad range of topics but there are three things that I was hoping to touch upon today that is first up automation the second is um, blockchain uh, and it's a word that's often bandied around but I want to try and describe and put into real life what that means from an insurer's perspective and the third is in relation to data now Clearly, from an automation perspective, there are different and varying ranges of automation. And uh, you know, from an insurer's perspective, the reality is ship owners are starting to experiment already. Uh, regardless of what we may think, there are owners out there who come in you know, five or 10, 15 years' time will have fully automated vessels that as insurers that we've got to be able to insure and that we've got to be able to understand, whether it's from a loss prevention or whether it's from a rating perspective. And needless to say, automation gives rise to lots of challenging legal questions, whether it's in relation to uh, collision, whether it's in relation to uh, the interface between human and ship. I don't think we've got enough time to really touch on those, but that, that's a sort of 10 to 15 year horizon. Where I see technology impacting upon insurance in my sector in, in a much nearer uh, space of time is really in relation to blockchain. Now, blockchain it's often talked about and I really don't pretend to understand it save the fact it's a shared ledger of information so if you all are parties to a let's say I'm probably the best analogy is in relation to bills of lading if you have the shipper you have the receiver the bank and the ship owner all sharing the same information you're able to reduce the friction in the passage of information from one party to the other now 
it does so because blockchain works on the basis that you all share the same information. That information is held remotely, it's secure, it's safe, and you can only ever change it with, uh, with the agreement of all the other parties in that chain. Now, where I see that intersecting with insurance, and actually we have a very real-life example of that, is that we are starting to see the likes of Maersk uh, requiring their ship owners to be part of a blockchain. In other words, they provide real-time live information to their insurer about their vessels. <coughs> it could be through uh, data that's collected from on board the ship, but also it's in relation to where the ship is located, what is happening, what is being carried. All of that requires and demands that the insurer, by receiving that information, is able to tailor the price of the insurance that they provide to Maersk. And that's ultimately what they're looking to achieve. It's a tailored insurance product. Within the world of P&I, we provide blanket cover. It's 365 days a year, wherever you are in the world. But I can increasingly see, and we're already having demands upon us from other owners, that in the next 12 to 36 months, we're gonna be obliged to start tailoring our insurances. Why? Well, owners want to be able to demonstrate that their risk profile is better than other owners, and that by sharing that information, they can drive down costs. But secondly, and more important, or just as importantly, is uh, ease of, flow of information. If you're dealing with everything on an electronic platform, you don't have the issues that you have to send emails, you don't have to have uh, people processing documentation, you don't have to wait until you receive your debit note or, or, or credit note. All of that will be done seamlessly in an electronic environment. And that's really where I start to see blockchain interfacing. Now, from a legal perspective, and again, I turn to my esteemed colleagues on the panel, but that also gives rise to challenges around jurisdiction, around apportionment of liability, and, and, and actually not many jurisdictions are ready for this technology, but one thing is, from an insurer's perspective, I firmly feel that we have to be. The third and probably final point in relation to technology is a demands upon uh, the data that we as insurers have. Now, the Standard Club insures 10% of the world fleet. Within the international group, we insure 95% of the world fleet. Yet, do the clubs share information between one another? Very limited. Uh, and given the power of the information that we have, or, or the, the amount of information we have, I feel it's incumbent upon international group clubs to share that information uh, on an anonymized basis. Why? Well, we should be looking at ways in which we can drive down premium for ship owners by having that information, allowing us to better assess and evaluate risk. We're able to better support ship owners. Uh, but also, if we're not doing it, someone else will be. And I think it's very easy to sit here and assume that, you know, within the international club with high limits of cover, uh, I think, you know, Tradewinds quite aptly describes it as a cartel, that we're insulated. Well, the reality is we aren't. And if we don't innovate, and if we don't embrace this technology now, and we have to do it now, then I think you know, it puts all of our livelihoods at risk. And it's important as a service provider uh, to the shipping industry that we stay relevant uh, and, and we're here for the future. Thank you very much, James. And this is, I think, in a way, dovetailing also with what, say, the younger ship owners were mentioning before. Um, there was this discussion on, say, exchange of information, communications, and so on, uh, which is a reality. Um, the reality is that uh, today, the amount of information which is available is huge. Uh, the thing is putting all together in the same place and make it available. And that is something which I'm sure will be a challenge which they will have to face. I don't think it's, well, it's gonna be your time or my time when we're going, we are going to see these big changes. Blockchain is taking up, but say, it takes years before it actually spreads out uh, to, to, to its full potential and so on. That's uh, another, another, I think, challenge for uh, whoever is gonna be in this business going forward. So thank you very much. And um, then if anybody has any questions on what Jace was saying, then perhaps we do it at the end of the first uh, tour. Eh? Francesco. Oh, thank you, Federico. Thank you, James. And now uh, we pass, uh, I think you are all, um, uh, all the members of the crew of shipping and the law, but uh, we have a new member that is um, Mario Ricomagno, and I would like to give just a little bit more of time to Mario, because um, uh, among the other things in his life, he devoted a lot of uh, his effort uh, uh, to arbitration. Uh, we had uh, in the past edition three uh, president 
of uh, London Maritime Arbitrators Association, Bruce Aris, uh, Clive Aston, who came many times, and uh, Chris Moss. Uh, so I think I would like to ask uh, Mario, who is an international man, as a member of uh, CMI, but also uh, um, a very respectable uh, Italian uh, lawyer, if uh, perhaps uh, uh, the concept of um, arbitra arbitration, in particular commercial and shipping arbitration, connected to a sig single country like uh, uh, the, the, for instance, arbitration, LMA arbitrations or other type of London arbitration, uh, can um, give the place to a sort of wider um, community of uh, people who trust themselves and uh, obviously trust also the, the Court of Appeals that should uh, perhaps uh, appeal, judge the decision of the awards of the arbitrators. But I leave um, uh, the floor to Mario who will uh, talk about these things, hoping in the next, uh, the 10th edition of the shipping, uh, of the shipping and the law, to have a full section dedicated to arbitration. Thank you. Um, no. um, thank you, Francesco, just uh, no. first, of all, for inviting, first of all for inviting me. Can you hear? Sorry. Thank you, uh, Francesco, for in, first of all, for inviting me to attend this uh, this uh, conference. It is a very good formula. I congratulate with you because it is a very simple and colloquial way for uh, discussing hot topics on, uh, on shipping in general and also to have uh, this mixed formula of having uh, um, ship owners, uh, um, operators of, of the ship, uh, shipping trade together with lawyers as well. Uh, I think that uh, conventions having only lawyers, uh, they can be perhaps uh, too much uh, far away from the reality sometimes, and uh, uh, so this is a very good uh, example. Speaking about uh, arbitration, as, uh, uh, that which is uh, my topic of today, uh, you know, um, arbitration uh, in the shipping uh, trade is a uh, uh, notion which uh, um, should be um, considered under uh, the general uh, view of the international commercial arbitration. International commercial arbitration is uh, the mm, best way, in terms of best, I mean uh, the uh, uh, more uh, simple way to try to accommodate the disputes. Disputes are part of the trade, as a matter of fact. They have also a, a cost in terms of image of the companies, in terms of, of money, and in terms also of relationships between the parties of that dispute. So uh, in international commercial arbitration is the best way to accommodate the disputes which have a transborder nature. In other way, the, the, the disputes which uh, can somehow have uh, parties of different countries which relates uh, to uh, uh, trades uh, in uh, different uh, jurisdictions of areas of the world. And they have a very substantial clash between cultures, as a matter of fact. Try to imagine a litigation between uh, uh, an Italian company and a US company, where there are two councils coming, one from the uh, so-called continental civil law and the other one from common law. Uh, common law lawyers are accustomed to cross-examination, um, uh, cross for instance, for, for, for collecting the, uh, the witnesses' the positions. Uh, the uh, continental uh, lawyers instead are not accustomed to at all to the direct way um, under which uh, the uh, cross-examination is conducted and uh, uh, they are accustomed to a much more uh, uh, formal way for collecting the position. This can give a very, a very distant way for disputing, and if there are international arbitrators prepared 
to accommodate this kind of disputes, taking something from the common law, law world and some from the civil law world, uh, uh, in terms also of procedural aspects, uh, this uh, is uh, the only possible way for try to solve the disputes. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the international commercial arbitration uh, pattern. Uh, maritime arbitration has, uh, uh, is, it has its own specificity within uh, this uh, uh, general um, uh, trend of the international commercial arbitration. But uh, basically it takes some, some basics from the, from the international commercial arbitration as such. Of course, it uh, must be uh, much more uh, um, uh, in line with what is the shipping trade, which is a shipping which is per se international and is a uh, trade which is based on what the French call the droit formulaire. In other words, uh, it's much more based on customs of trade on, uh, on, 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 on the contractual aspects much more than uh, the enacted state laws. Um, with this specificity, um, the, shipping, uh, um, the, the shipping lawyers, the shipping council uh, has to do their, their daily business. Now, um, historically, um, there, uh, there have been uh, some attempts to try to um, um, unify, in some way, the uh, world of the shipping arbitration uh, in a general context. Um, taking, taking it that there are in the world uh, 20, approximately 20 maritime arbitration centers, uh, so devoted only to the uh, management of the disputes concerning uh, the shipping trade, uh, and taking also the view that m some of the major institutional courts uh, of arbitration, like ICC, uh, London Court of International Arbitration, AAA in uh, New York, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, uh, also um, um, uh, Tokyo uh, as well, uh, they are having uh, special parts of their uh, special de department dealing with shipping law. Uh, mm, the idea was whether it was possible somehow to uh, make the, these uh, uh, rules of the arbitration and the practice of these arbitration centers much more close each other. Uh, attempts were made in the 96 and the 97 in uh, the area of uh, ICMA, International Congress of Maritime Arbitrators, uh, which was a center which was uh, um, created by the, the well-known uh, arbitrator uh, Cedric Berkeley uh, in the 70s. And um, uh, that attempt uh, uh, together with another attempt which has been conducted by the ICC together with CMI, which had uh, enacted the, the, the rules of ICC CMI, but, but were not functioning uh, very well, to try to, to, to make them more modern and somehow. Uh, after various uh, uh, studies that have been made uh, worldwide between uh, uh, the, um, the single nations uh, uh, and in particular the uh, CMI member states uh, has led to a conclusion that uh, London is uh, the place where uh, maritime arbitration is conducted uh, with, uh, uh, which leads the, the uh, the cases because they have a, a great, a very great number of cases in comparison with the others. Uh, London uh, make uh, the, the users of the arbitration not completely happy, but at, at the moment there are no particular um, um, uh, other centers that can replace London as, as such. Also CMI, more recently, uh, has set up a working group on, arbi on maritime arbitration 
uh, not with the idea of having a, a court of arbitration within the CMI, which should be inconsistent with the scope of uh, um, the CMI as such, but uh, to, um, to have a place where information uh, could be given to all those having to deal with uh, maritime arbitration and so to make them more uh, having more knowledge of, uh, of this uh, uh, way of settling the, the <coughs> disputes. Uh, however, even this attempt which uh, uh, was made in CMI and it was an attempt which commenced in 2015 after two years of study uh, ended with uh, um, uh, a resolution by the General Assembly saying that uh, it, it was no point for CMI to, uh, uh, to invest in, uh, in, in this project. So uh, the situation uh, at international level uh, through these institutional uh, um, uh, centers uh, was not uh, successful as a matter of fact, but the uh, maritime arbitration is a reality. Uh, it needs in any case uh, to be uh, considered and studied uh, to, to, to function in a better way. Uh, shall we consider that uh, maritime arbitration uh, uh, now has also to, to face the other uh, I, I don't call it challenge because it is not, not a challenge, but uh, the other way of setting the disputes uh, coming from a mediation. Uh, mediation is a much more simple way to, uh, to, 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 to settle amicably the disputes. It is uh, enormously less, cost, uh, less costly. Uh, however, what happens when the mediation fails? There is no other possibility other than to go to courts or to go to arbitration. Um, yes, so I think that I have answered to, you, to your question today, uh, for, for this moment, and uh, uh, after you. Thank yeah. you very much, Mario. I know you, we discussed this matter in, in more detail, but I think that next year, with other colleagues, uh, we should have a full section dedicated, perhaps I was thinking of a longer section, to, to arbitration and perhaps mediation. And I thank you also because I think you now introduced the questions that uh, Federico uh, would like to make uh, to Jonathan Lux. Absolutely the same, because I, here we started talking about we are users, okay? So from time to time it's difficult for us to understand some of the subtlety of uh, choosing an arbitration rather than a mediation or selecting to go in court and so on. Um, mediation, it's obviously coming from the past. There was an issue in between somebody, you were going to the wise man and the wise man was sorting it out. Arbitration is, uh, instead of being the wise man, you are going to the council of the wise men and you were to sort it out possibly quickly. quickly. Uh, otherwise, you had to go to the king or to the boss of the tribe and sort it out, which is going in court today for me. Um, arbitrator, arbitrators, we have heard what Mario had to say. On mediation, give us, try to give us a little bit of it, an idea of why it is, uh, it is uh, different or possibly a better choice for two parties in dispute to go to mediation rather than to arbitration. And then I will ask the same question, possibly, um, insofar as going to court, court as an alternative, as you were saying. We users of uh, say the system, can we be, can we be advised uh, on the difference, on the time it takes to resolve possibly a litigation following one of the three alternatives, and costs, which are another important thing when you have to discuss about these things. I would actually, I leave it to you, who wants to start first on uh, giving this more small recap for us users. Thank you. I'm happy to respond to the <laughs> invitation. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by thanking Francesco and his excellent team uh, for their wonderful hospitality. Um, Mario has spoken eloquently about 
arbitration. I'll look at dispute resolution uh, a little more widely. Um, conscious of the title of this session, um, also have in mind the future, but to look at the future, you need to bear in mind the past. And perhaps I could just start with a quote from uh, US Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger about 40 years ago. And he said this, the existing judicial system is too costly too painful, too destructive, too inefficient for a truly civilized people. Reliance on the adversarial process as the principal means of resolving disputes is a mistake that must be corrected. For some disputes, trials will be the only means, but for many claims, <clears throat> trial by adversarial contest must in time go the way of the ancient trial by battle and blood. Now, what's he referring to there? Uh, this isn't a joke. Um, uh, something over 100 years ago, in fact, the norm in the UK was uh, trial by battle. Uh, that evolved into trial by the uh, king or queen personally administering justice, traveling throughout the country. And that is the reason, by the way, that the biggest division of the High Court of Justice in London is known as the Queen's Bench Division, because it is the Queen's judges who administer justice. Um, slow, expensive, uh, problematic. All of us know some of the issues with um, litigation. So uh, arbitration was spawned as perhaps the first form of alternative dispute resolution. Um, and uh, indeed, I belong to uh, a club known as the Mafia, uh, which stands, uh, my club uh, defines the Mafia as more arbitration for international arbitrators. <laughs> but the problem with arbitration, some would say, is that it has also, over time, become over-lawyered and uh, therefore suffers the same problems of delay uh, and expense as the litigation process. Uh, indeed, one High Court judge in London described arbitration as unwigged court proceedings because uh, we arbitrators, maybe some of us should, but we don't wear wigs, whereas the judges, of course, do. So <clears throat> uh, arbitration doesn't um, uh, satisfy uh, the requirements for uh, speed and cost effectiveness, uh, certainly for uh, smaller disputes. Um, and in the United States, probably about 40 years ago, about the time that the quote that I started off by reading uh, was uttered, uh, there was a move in the United States for uh, ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, or defined by many lawyers <laughs> as uh, alarming drop in revenue because it serves in enabling uh, disputes to be settled in a fraction of the time that would be taken in court or arbitration. Now, Mario perfectly fairly said that a problem with mediation is that it is not guaranteed to secure a settlement, and that is perfectly correct. But the best available data in the UK uh, published by uh, the biggest ADR provider in the UK, which has also offices around the world, <coughs> called CEDA, the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution. Uh, they carry out a biennial audit, and their data suggests that something approaching 90% of mediations uh, are successful. Of course, it depends how you define success, but I'm assuming 
that means either a complete or partial settlement of the matters in issue. So um, just a few words, if I may, on uh, mediation, uh, why to mediate and when to mediate. And please do tell me if I'm running out of time or if I've uh, talking. preferably with a minute or two's notice. <laughs> Francesco, you're in charge of this. So just, just to explain the key difference between mediation on the one hand and uh, arbitration or litigation on the other hand, and uh, the best story I know for this purpose involves um, an orange, or because we're a shipping uh, audience, let's call it a shipment. I have to enunciate that very carefully. A shipment of oranges. So uh, this side of the room says the oranges are their oranges and the other side says, no, it's uh, our oranges. What could a judge or arbitrator do? The judge or arbitrator would make a decision and say the, arbit the oranges go to uh, the claimants or the oranges go to the respondents or in an unusual case may say 50-50 or I guess in a corrupt system, they say, thanks very much, I'll take the oranges. <laughs> um, uh, those broadly are the choices. Now, if the matter goes to mediation, the mediator is not making any decision, is the first point. The mediator is trying to drill down and explore um, interests and needs uh, as opposed to the positions and rights, which are what in, are an issue in court or arbitration. So the skilled mediator discovers that this side of the room needs the fruit of the orange to make orange juice, and this side of the room needs the uh, skin, the rind, to make marmalade. So in fact, in fact, both their interests can be catered for from the same orange or shipment of oranges. Now I have to say, having uh, conducted quite a few mediations, it's rather unusual to find the parties' interests aligning quite so neatly, but I hope that illustrates the difference uh, between uh, the two processes. So briefly on why to mediate and when to mediate, um, why the, uh, I think there are four key factors. Uh, the first two really go hand in hand, and that is uh, speed and cost. Um, 80, the 80 20 rule uh, steps in. Uh, it was an American lawyer friend, I don't know how empirical the research was, but who said to me, you know, in the average case, 20% of the time and cost is spent acquiring 80% of the necessary evidence, and it follows that the balance of 80% is spent on the remaining 20%, which is not a very economic model. And so the ideal with mediation would be to mediate at the stage where or perhaps even slightly prior to the time when you've acquired that 80% uh, of the evidence when you've spent perhaps 20% or less of the overall cost. So um, time and cost advantage <coughs> advantages. Um, a third advantage is innovative solutions. Now, you saw it with the uh, orange, no judge would have had the power to say, okay, you'll get the fruit and you'll get the right. That would not have been a possible outcome in court or arbitration, um, but it is something that can be a part of a settlement arrived at in a mediation. And I could, perhaps later if time permits, give you an example, a real life shipping example, uh, which would bring that point more to life, but I'll, I'll leave that till later. The thank you, thank uh, you, Jonathan. I think, I, I think the, the, the fourth and, uh, and, and the next question will be done in the 10th edition of Shipping and the Law. Okay. 
But uh, just a, a quick one, because I know you are like me, uh, uh, ve ve very young in your spirit and very enthusiastic. Uh, as a mediator, um, are you happy when um, an agreement, a solution is found, or are you trying to, as much as you can, not to find whatsoever agreement, whatsoever uh, settlement, but uh, a fair settlement? You have to reply with one, maximum two sentences, please. <laughs> I can't necessarily assess uh, the overall fairness of the settlement, given that I've only got a fraction of the uh, information. information and documentation that the parties and their lawyers uh, will have. I only have what they chose to put before me. Um, settlement is the desired outcome, but uh, it's not my job to force the parties to into a settlement. Okay, thank you very much. Perhaps we will have a small section uh, on mediation in our arbitration uh, conference next year. Uh, David, uh, I, I think uh, we, this time we, I always ask you a very hot subject. And, uh, uh, I don't know if a rest of vessels is a hot subject. I, I think, uh, <coughs> I suspect you may want to speak about uh, UK arrest of vessel, which is uh, this day is very common also because uh, the next section we will see uh, how um, uh, loans are traded between uh, banks and other financial institutions. And I think that um, arrest of a vessel may be uh, one uh, step uh, that is going to happen in this very uh, painful process and uh, perhaps uh, uh, the arresting party is not always uh, right. Uh, you may have uh, uh, some wrongful arrest. I think this is uh, about what you are going to talk to us. So, Th Thank you, Francesco. Um, you've raised the bar just a little bit. I was already feeling a little bit like an intruder when thinking about how I'm going to shoehorn uh, a subject which is based on principles established in the Elizabethan era, reaching their maturity about 160 years ago under the heading, The Future Is Now. I now have to make it hot as well, which is even harder. Um, there is topicality, though, and with the contrivance, say, of a 70s DJ, I can make the two work. There has been a, a debate which has been rumbling on for some time and has been postponed both in the courts and at the institutional level. And as it happens, that those will be aired in the Court of Appeal on the 6th of November and at the CMI conference on the 9th of November in London. So I can claim topicality. And as that long-awaited de debate is about to happen, the future in that respect is now. Um, whether it's hot or not, let's see. Topicality, briefly. The reason I wish to just touch on that uh, is it's very important to me. We represent the owners of a vessel called the Alcyon, which, as the Admiralty judge recently remarked, was the first uh, a vessel which raises important questions of arrest for the first time in 30 years. The judge willingly gave leave to appeal. The Court of Appeal gave leave to hear that appeal on an expedited basis. As I say, we're working towards that uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, along with that, we had a recent vis strong visitation from the Italian Maritime Law Institute who participated in an excellent seminar at James's office where one of our leading lawyers, a former judge, indeed a former participant of shipping in the law, Sir Bernard Eder, gave a powerful paper on why the English law needs to change. Um, as I say, it's coming up before the CMI, and I think uh, there as an echo of the splendid tribute yesterday to Francesco Berlingeri, it is the sort of comparative law issue which was so important to him and which he felt could be shaped by uh, the community of lawyers which I think your conference so splendidly represents, Francesco. Um, as a further footnote to, uh, in honor of Francesco Berlingeri, it's interesting that in a leading high court judgment by the on the bench, the leading admiralty jurist, he cited Francesco's 
uh, um, magnus opus, the arrest of ships recently. Finally, in terms of topicality, I think there's a zeitgeist element to this. Um, as you hint, the right to arrest is something which a financier might use. And I sense that the finance arrangements are much more fluid. What the borrower, uh, the person the borrower contracts with now might not necessarily be the person taking the decisions. And there are devices which might be exploited perhaps to have a very intrusive effect on his business. So that's my point for topicality. And I think it's also worthwhile reminding ourselves about the realities of arrest, certainly in England. We talk about it on a day-to-day -day basis as lawyers, but actually it's not so common. If you look, say, in England, there were hundreds in the last calendar year, 2017, there were 165 admiralty claim forms issued. There were only 10 arrests, and of those arrests, there were only three cells. So it, it's not an everyday happening. Um, but if it happens to you, if you're one of the 10, it's potentially ruinous. A feature of this is that it's not uh, the sole desert or, or the sole um, punishment for a failing business. It could happen to anyone. It's immediate, and it truly interferes with your business. I don't really like analogies with other industries, but if you're a hotel and you faced a random claim, you would be very distressed if suddenly your guests were evicted and your do doors closed. So it has that catastrophic effect on a ship owner's business. So again, I think that's another reason to remind ourselves what it is, what it is not, and how the balance might be achieved. What it is, is a very quick, simple remedy. It requires simply the presence of the vessel. There is no requirement for English jurisdiction or governing law. It just has to be a maritime claim. Procedurally, it's very easy. You don't, unlike a freezing order, have to go before a judge. You have to issue a claim form. You have to issue two other forms. It's relatively cheap. If you look at some of the uh, solicitors' websites, they quote figures of a few thousand pounds. What it is not is often surprising to people. An order from the Admiralty Court arresting a vessel is not an order of a judge of the court. It's an administrative order. It's not based on a scrutinized claim. It's not moderated by any discretion on the merits or the suitability of the remedy. It is not the basis of an immediate right to compensation if that claim proves to be flawed. And as I say, it is not directed against a failed business, it just requires a claim. Neither, so it is not proportionate. If you have a claim for $10,000, you can arrest and have that catastrophic effect upon a vessel worth, say, $50 million. Okay. In many respects, it's very different from the freezing order, which it's often compared with. The two issues which I think give rise to the debates and which we sought to uh, create a balance within the Alpion and which will form the basis of the debates in, um, in the Alcyon was, was it, sorry, the two elements that come up often before the um, international committees are wrongful arrest, and that is my point about no um, right to claim if the claim happens to prove to be flawed. In England, the bar is very high, and it's been restated again, that a sim simple failed claim does not automatically give the owner the right to recover. Now, pausing there, me, no one is suggested, those who are in favor of some change or moderation in the law is saying that we should do away with the right of arrest. No one is saying you should limit the rights to enforce and secure your claims. What they should do is be principled and balanced and proportionate. Um, I think in the arrest context, the accident waiting to happen, so to speak, is that claim which is large, genuinely contested, perhaps even based on specious grounds, and falls outside the scope of insurance cover. And that is how uh, I think an owner might be exposed. What he will not necessarily be able to do 
is then to claim damages, even if the vessel has been detained for many months indeed. And it's my hotel closure point. A way of moderating this would be counter security, which you often see in freezing orders, such that the arresting party gives up, in our case, we say, an undertaking in damages no different from a party obtaining a freezing order. So and it's on those respects that you see a great difference between the jurisdictions. In our case, a bank has sub-participated its loan, so the person who controls the loan effectively is not the person the borrower did the business with. He then goes in, and like most loans, there's a value to loan covenant. The broker who determines the value is determined by the discretion of the bank. That party goes and gets a valuation which is well below the market, accelerates the loan, and arrests the vessel. Why do I mention this? Partly because it's my zeitgeist element. Those features we're seeing, there are other cases like this, are becoming more common. When we look at the discretionary element, which we invite the court to invoke on the counter security or undertaking damages, it should be very easy for a bank to say, to give the normal wording, which isn't even a full guarantee, uh, oblige, uh, honoring any order which the court might make for losses caused by the owner, but it refuses to do so. So, as I say, the, the, the topical issues are should we change the law of wrongful arrest? Should the bar be lowered as it is in some countries? I think in Italy the, the relevant test is something like beyond ordinary prudence. In England it requires malice um, and the, it's akin to malicious prosecution. So that would require some re-engineering of the law. Alternatively, you could balance it quite easily by obliging the arresting party when it proves that its claim is wrong, having caused perhaps months of uh, loss of revenue of the owner, simply to um, give recompense to the, the borrower. It's that latter point which will come before the Court of Appeal. It's one of the two points that will be determined by the CMI. Um, to close, I think those who are relatively conservative on the law say that the principle of giving undertakings effectively as counter security are so well established, um, the law shouldn't change. It was set, the principles were set in the middle of the 19th century. I don't think that's a good answer to ship owners who face these hazards, particularly if this sort of claim is going to be more commonplace. And I don't think um, a theme of this conference is modernity and change. And I don't think in an age of change, we should be uh, afraid of charting or, uh, a new course in terms of what a party who is going to invoke this draconian right has to do and what the victim's rights are. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, next time I need something more hot. You, you know it. It was very interesting. Okay, now uh, I think we have uh, last but very hot. I wanted to ask Mark Laff, who is a um, uh, competition lawyer and a European law lawyer, uh, something about the overwhelming role that uh, competition is um, having a bit uh, in every industry, including the, the shipping. But uh, th this would be too wide, so I think we have also to postpone it. And since we are in uh, <laughs> uh, just before the what is going to be the Brexit, probably, um, I, I would like to, to make a very simple question to Mark. Uh, how do you see the uh, status and uh, the evolution of the European law with particular respect uh, on matters that concern the shipping world? Uh, you know, at this particular time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'd like to start by thanking my friend Francesco for inviting me to speak at the conference today. It's a great honor for me to do so because I have been uh, to many of the previous shipping and the law conferences. And indeed, in the early days, Francesco would ask me to speak on the subject of competition law to try to terrify the audience so that they would realize, in particular, ship owners, that they had to comply with competition law or be fined 10% of their worldwide annual turnover. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to pick up three points uh, that my fellow panelists have mentioned, and indeed uh, earlier discussion, and give you a, an, a very quick EU perspective. The first one is the role of women in the world. The second is technology, and a little bit about competition law. And the final one is reality, and that might bring me back to Brexit. So women, I thought you'd like to know that the Commissioner for Transport in Brussels is Violeta Buk, a Slovenian lady. The Commissioner for Competition Law is Mrs. Verstaga, a Danish lady. So there is some inspiration for our younger uh, women who may or may not still be in this room. Technology. I thought the presentation on technology was really spot on, thank you. I suffer not being a mathematician, but having now to understand about algorithms and how, for example, shipping lines use algorithms to, I wouldn't use the word fix, but to arrange their prices to their customers. And of course, the whole area of information exchange and, and data is now number one on the agenda in Brussels, at least for Mrs. Verstaga, the competition commissioner. And then changing gear to reality. And this makes me sad in one sense, although I haven't given up. And my first view on Brexit is that it won't happen. And I'm slightly surprised that, and I stress this, the international business community isn't doing more about stopping it. And I don't just mean those in the UK, but in countries like Italy, France, and Germany, who's trying to stop Brexit? I just ask you that question, because you're going to suffer just as much as the rest of the world if Brexit happens. And I'm going to end by pointing out how the European Commission, which of course has a job to do, has on the 27th of February 2018 published its guidance to stakeholders on Brexit and maritime transport. And I'm going to read you this, if I may, fellow chairman, as my closing piece. Subject to any transitional arrangement that may be contained in a possible withdrawal agreement as of the withdrawal date, that's the 29th of March, 2019, the European Commission notice says, the EU rules in the field of maritime transport no longer apply to the United Kingdom. This has in particular the following consequences in different areas of union law in the field of maritime transport. I have to turn the page. Oops, sorry. So I'll just tell you what it says under market access, because although it's directed at the UK, of course it applies also to um, uh, entry into the UK as well. Intra-union shipping services and third country traffic under the 1986 regulation stipulates the freedom to provide maritime transport services between member states, as well as between member states and non-EU countries. 
in respect of nationals of member states who are established in a member state other than that of the person for whom the services are intended, and nationals of the member states established outside the EU, or shipping companies established outside the EU and controlled by nationals of a member state, if their vessels are registered in that member state in accordance with its legislation. I'm quoting the Commission's notice, remember. And finally, on this point, it says, persons or companies who, as of the withdrawal date, do not meet those criteria that I've just read out, will no longer benefit from this regulation, notably in terms of non-discriminatory treatment as regards international maritime transport connections. So that's in the context of freedom to provide services. It goes on to say the same thing about cabotage. But as I say, whilst this is directed at saying that you in Italy can now discriminate against UK shipping interests, of course it will apply the other way round as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, th I think now you are putting the... We would like uh, Valeria to comment. Uh, I mean, uh, she, there are so many interesting things, but uh, for uh, her ship owners and also the only lady <laughs> perspective, generally we say ladies first, but you will conclude. Uh, I don't know if you want to make any comment or ask anything in particular to one of the panelists. Thank you, Francesco. It's an honor for me to be sit here with you. And so thank you for this second opportunity. I will be, will be very quick because the time is gone and because I'm infiltrated here. But James, please, I have a very quick question for you. We spoke about technology. We all the time speak about technology and new technologies. And from the ship owner's side, you know, uh, we are focused all the time how to reduce our running cost because in these difficult times is a, an important item for us. So in this regard, how do you see the use of technology uh, to drive down the cost, the, the insurance cost for the ship owners? Thank you, Valeria. Um, that's an excellent question. And um, actually, it was quite refreshing to hear Jonathan talking about mediation. You know, from an insurer's perspective, there are three principal elements to the cost of insurance. One is the claims. So any opportunity to mediate and to settle early, of course, is something that we encourage. Uh, the second aspect, of course, is the, is the risk profile that the ship owner presents to the club. Now, uh, by sharing information, whether it's who you trade with, what you trade, where you trade, I do see that in the future, with ship owners sharing that information, there could be some real benefits for them to see because by sharing and providing that detailed information, it allows the clubs to better evaluate the risk profile and uh, with that to better tailor the costs of the insurance. And I think the best example of that in the UK is with motor insurance. You now have telematics. Your car communicates with your insurer. It tells them whether you're driving too fast, whether you're driving too slow. I mean, it wouldn't apply in Naples with the taxis here, clearly, but um, <laughs> by providing that information, the insurer should expect to receive, uh, the insured, sorry, should expect to receive a better tailored insurance to fit their needs. And by, you know, if they're a good member of the club, they should see with that a reduction in the, uh, the cost of their insurance. I think the final element to touch on, and that is, of course, the cost of running a club. Um, our board at the Standard Club make it very clear to the managers that they expect to see us pushing down costs. Uh, and I think as a, as, a, as a member of the club, you should be expecting your club to reduce the frictional cost of running its business. And with that, that includes looking at the ways in which technology can support the claims and the underwriting process, but also importantly, to drive and encourage loss prevention too. And uh, you know, our board has promoted and <coughs> Uh, uh, ensured that we should be looking at ways in which we use technology better. And with that, they've said, look, you know, rather than spending money on systems, 
if I look at systems that can reduce your overall cost to running the club, whether that's reducing the number of people, whether that's using uh, technology to better evaluate risks, but we have to, we can't, uh, we can't not turn over every stone in that process because we understand we're a cost to your business and uh, in, the, in the current markets, no more than ever should we be looking and focusing on running down those costs. Okay, thank you, but we still have uh, insurance brokers as well. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. joking. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Joking. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I'd like to speak about this, but uh, I think we have to finish. So another uh, quick thing to, to speak with uh, David, please. I'm, I'm sure that Fabrizio is uh, giving his time to you with great pleasure. He's a gentleman. The, the next section, Fabrizio. Yeah, Mettosi. Fabrizio will speak about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> long no, session. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Sorry, David. Um, we know that there is a strong activity in selling and buying second hand vessels in all over the world, of course. And uh, in this regard, I know from my broker's friends that there are very specific uh, insurance products to cover all the maritime, the, oh, not all, but the maritime risks may be related to the debts of the previous owner. Mm. Uh, I think it could be useful and interesting in this panel to briefly update us about these uh, insurance products. Well, that, that's Thank a very you. good question, Valeria, <laughs> but you're probably asking the wrong person. <laughs> because, uh, and maybe James ha has some experience with that. Um, it is a hazard uh, that we see typically with maritime liens like collisions and salvage which <coughs> will follow vessels when they're sold um, and also when writs are issued just before the sale takes place and of course in the standard MOA the warranty that you get from your seller is usually against a Marshall Island seller or something like that. Personally I'm aware of the, the fact that there is a so-called maritime lien insurance out there um, I've done quite a lot of cases where this has been a factor or we've tried to moderate against it. The standard advice is to look at the, to do writ searches, but to be honest, I'm not, I really have, haven't seen it very active in the market. I don't know whether James, uh, either within Charles Taylor, which is such a big <coughs> insurance group, or even Federico, you might have some no, experience. There is, there is something moving in that. Uh, mm. There are new products which are coming in line, which are sort of a TDI kind of cover. Mm. So basically, are not necessarily linked uh, to the, the typical lien insurance. Uh, they are, I would say, still a little bit untested. So we are carefully reviewing them. Um, there are a couple of products which are being presented on the market by reliable carriers. By I don't know if Lloyds have yet produced anything like that, but certainly the Scandinavian market is offering something like that and it is meant to be a sort of all-in except it's it's an it's a sort of expanded loss of fire where you pick up a number of other risks including by the way delay which is probably the most important risk which a ship owner which cannot be insured any in any other way because a, a, a non-hull related uh, uh, delay, which would typically be covered by a loss of fire, uh, if it is not related, if the delay is not relating to a casualty of the ship or a peril covered under the Italian machinery, it wouldn't be covered. So these policies are tending to expand in that direction. Um, we're studying them, okay? Yeah. We're studying. I think studying the, other, the other way of addressing the problem is to back the seller's obligation with some sort of guarantee, but that's not something a financier or insurance company would do. So unless you have a substantial seller, um, the pro it's very hard to get a meaningful guarantee. And of course, with a substantial seller, you probably don't need that protection anyway, but it's something to look and at. And for you to know, Valeria, they're not coming for free, these things. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> not for free. <laughs> not for free. Okay, I think the, we are talking about uh, the Usual question, would you buy a, a car from, from him? <laughs> I think this is at the root of the problem. Anyway, uh, thank Francis you very much. Francisco, if, would if you I, like to conclude? If, uh, if I may, just one minute. And you I, conclude the panel. No, no, I just wanted to ask one thing. Uh, 
You mentioned Brexit. We, and say the ship owners particularly, are continuing to negotiate contracts where, say, say, they have to make a choice. High Court, London Arbitration, whatever it is. After Brexit, particularly for an Italian ship owner, still part of the community, is there going to be any change which, is, which needs to be considered when selecting your jurisdiction, when selecting High Court as against arbitration? Is there going to be any more difficulties, for example, in enforcing an arbitration or, or, a, or a court judgment after Brexit? The short answer is no. Uh, <coughs> uh, arbitration is outside the uh, Brussels Convention. Yeah. Um, so uh, enforcement of arbitration awards depends on the New York, New York. Convention. Uh, beyond that, there may even ultimately be one advantage. Uh, not that I'm in favor of Brexit, but Post-Brexit, there was a case called West Tankers, which involved Italy. Uh, there was a London arbitration clause. Court proceedings were started in Italy. Uh, the ship owner tried to obtain an anti-suit injunction in England to prevent the Italian proceedings. And the European Court of Justice said, no, yeah. you can't do that. Now, perhaps after Brexit, depending on what's agreed, of course, overall, uh, it may again be possible to obtain uh, an anti-suit injunction. Um, and there's a very, very recent case, actually. High Court judge, there were proceedings in breach of an arbitration clause started in Cyprus and in Russia. And the judge granted an anti-suit injunction in respect of the Cyprus, uh, sorry, the Russian proceedings and said, no, um, the Brussels Convention had been amended. It's called the Brussels Recast Convention. And the judge ruled that didn't make a difference. Still no anti-suit injunction. Thank you very uh, much. Yes, uh, I'd like to footnote to that, uh, Mario, Federico. Um, while the position with arbitration will necessarily stay the same because it's in the international context, is essentially uh, exported through the medium of the New York Convention. The recast Brussels is a function of our membership of the European Union. Now, non-members, uh, or those who opt out, have been able historically to go into things like the Lugano and the San Sebastian. Um, I was looking at this for last year's shipping in the law, and I was chatting to Chris Smith QC, who's a very knowledgeable chap, here about this and there's been a dearth of material and there was a paper produced uh, discussion paper produced last summer which merely showed that whoever was producing that paper hadn't really engaged with the subject at all I have not seen much at all nor have I heard about the plans to have a convention which tracks the Brussels Convention so I think it's a very good point and it's, I just think it's way down the list of priorities. And as the Brexit crisis begins to stack up, the esoterica of the conflicts of laws is not featuring high on the list of Mrs. May's priorities. Thank you very much. Yes, can I? Yeah. I think Mario and Mark. Mm. Mario and Mark, perhaps somebody should explain what an anti-suit <coughs> injunction is. Yeah. Speaking about the arbitration and Brexit, uh, I concur uh, with uh, Jonathan uh, that uh, um, in the immediate and uh, in the um, uh, short period or even medium period, um, London will not lose its uh, pole position. Um, shall we consider that the London Maritime Arbitration Association has 80% of the maritime arbitration in the world? The last statistics show that uh, uh, reference to the London Maritime Mar 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 Association has been 2,500 in uh, 1917. So uh, this uh, um, predominance of, the London, of London as a place of arbitration will not be reduced by Brexit because 
the awards are so-called circulating, uh, so can be enforced and recognized uh, abroad in other countries by a different instrument which is not affected by Brexit, like the New York Convention. However, in the long period, uh, I don't know whether this uh, optimistic view for the Londoners is, uh, <laughs> is uh, so, um, so strong. Because uh, uh, shall we consider that any center of arbitration exists and uh, um, has a, a good life if it is supported by a, ship, by a strong shipping community? The shipping cluster of a place uh, can also suppo can support the uh, superstructure like a, like a court of arbitration. If London might be affected in the long run. Uh, by the Brexit effect, also the London Maritime Arbitration Association and London as place of arbitration can have a reduction of work. Shall we consider also that after Brexit, uh, the parties which are not English uh, can be somehow reluctant to agree a, um, a English law as a law applicable to the contract? So uh, this is an another way that can affect also the English jurisdiction. And lastly, do not forget uh, that exists a directive, uh, which is the Lawyers' Service Directive, uh, which, uh, help, which um, uh, gives the possibility of lawyers in Europe uh, to, um, to exercise their, uh, their work, their, their job, also in other, uh, in other, in other uh, countries of Europe. If uh, this directive will not be effective anymore due to the Brexit, uh, I don't know whether the possibility for barrister, in, uh, uh, of English barrister, to, um, to do their job in other countries, as they do a lot actually, uh, also in the arbitration area, can, uh, uh, can, be, uh, can continue somehow. Uh, with regard to the jurisdiction uh, of uh, judgments, so not awards, uh, this is a huge problem, as a matter of fact, uh, because the principal instrument that uh, exists uh, in Europe, which is the Directive uh, 2015 uh, of the European Union, will be no longer applicable. So uh, this is a real great problem for the acknowledgement and enforcement uh, of uh, judgments rendered by uh, an English court in Europe and vice versa, of course. So more work for us as lawyers. <laughs> I want to give the last word to, to Mark, please. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Thanks. Uh, I only want to intervene because I had the privilege of going to a meeting with the Minister of Justice of the great United Kingdom in Brussels a couple of weeks ago where the agenda was jurisdiction and enforcement of judgments. And uh, I can tell you, because of course these people are hopeless, they have no agenda. They wanted to find out from the British lawyers in Brussels what the hell to do. And to cut it short, uh, they seem to be favoring keeping Lugano as a fallback position, i.e. because we will be a third country. Um, if there's no special deal done on jurisdiction and judgments. So that is the current complete chaos position of the British government. This, my second and last point is I'd like to pick up what Mario says, which I totally agree with, and that is that we already see in our work that uh, clients are choosing not to have English law and jurisdiction because they're very worried about the enforcement of their contracts. Now that's in a general sense, not just in shipping, uh, shipping may be easier to save from the London angle, but at the same time, you've got the question ultimately of the enforcement of a judgment coming out of a London court. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, Federico, you want to say anything? Right. No. Thank you very much to all of you. I hope that at the end it didn't become too technical. <laughs> Thank you. But I would like to call, uh, obviously it was a joke, uh, Fabrizio, you will get your uh, one hour and a quarter and we will slightly delay our lunch, but, uh, but not more. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So the, 
David Osler and Fabrizio Vertosi to moderate. Thank you, Valeria, for accepting my proposal. You did very well. Um, and then we have Professor Arturo Capasso, uh, economist and a friend, um, Angelo D'Amato, who is uh, a ship owner, but also a very experienced person in ship finance. Giuseppe, unfortunately, is not with us. He has a problem, Giuseppe Bottiglieri. But um, we have got uh, Massimo Racca, head of sub-performing loan of BPM. And ah. ah, OK, Andre. Con Angelo. Oh, perché Angelo non è napoletano. Due napoletani. Uh, due napoletani, two napoletan ship owners, no genuines, okay. Charles Pecca, managing director of Fortress Investment Group. Good morning, Mrs. Pecca. Hello, where is he? And um, So please, David, uh, where is David Osler? Ah, he's a microphone. David is there with his computer. W would you like to sit next to, to Fabrizio, David? W would you mind, uh, or perhaps Fabrizio can go that side, yes. The, so the two the two moderators work together as a team. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, I I leave you in peace and uh, I will listen to you. Angelo. Okay. okay, good morning um, and welcome to the session on ship finance of the future. And I'll start by thanking all of you for being here. I also need to thank our host, Studio Legale Lauro, for organizing this splendid event. We are going to be talking about the future in a moment, but let me start by talking about the past. We meet today in Italy, where 2,000 years ago, Roman orator Cicero famously described finance as the sinews of war. And unfortunately, our sinews seem to be weakening. The latest survey from Petrofin tells us that the shipping portfolio of the 40 largest lending banks fell by $10 billion last year, following a decline of over $40 billion in 2016. Uh, the bankers are still lending shipping $345 billion. That's equivalent to all planned investment in the power sector in the Middle East and North Africa for the next five years. But even so, the amount of money that is on loan at the moment is now the lowest for 11 years. And that shortfall from the banks is only partially being made up from other sources. My name is David Oslo and I'm a London-based journalist with Lloydslist.com, the shipping website. I've covered various aspects of the industry for over 20 years including especially finance. And with me this morning is Fabrizio Vettosi, Managing Director of Venice Shipping and Logistics, um, who will moderate this session jointly with me. In the final 10 minutes, uh, Fabrizio will give you a brief presentation. Um, I, I, so, sorry, yeah. David, but I will go through the panel 
giving my Snapchats is better. Oh, you'd rather yeah. to do that? Yeah. yeah, okay. Then last minute change of plan, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Fabrizio and I have six very distinguished. Oh, it looks like five. Has somebody uh, has somebody dropped out? The last who's Mr. Mr. Bottiglieri is missing. Okay, um, we have five very distinguished guests for you. Um, and let me introduce them in alphabetical order. We have, to my left, we have Arturo Capasso, who is an economist who works as a professor at three Italian universities. Very impressive. He's also a director of Virtus, a Naples-based investment company. Uh, Angelo D'Amato is the... Uh, he's a miss. Uh, he's... Right. Well, Angelo, um, I hope Angelo is going to join us on the stage. Um, he's the son of another famous Italian shipping family and... Andrea Garola. Yeah, yes. yeah, and uh, chief executive of Perseveranza di Navigazione. This is Angelo D'Amato. Yeah. He's Angelo D'Amato. He's not me. He's is that Right. Andrea. You're, 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 in, you're instead of Andrea. Yes, I participated actually to the first session with the young right. owners. Yes, yeah. I am uh, here, you know, I'm okay. substituting Mr. Giuseppe Bottiglieri, which is not here. That's yes. uh, yeah, the problem. Okay. Um, Mr. We should have, a, um, who's next on the list? Massimo Racca. Ma ma yes, Mr. Racca is the workout <laughs> guy at Banco Popolare and has previously worked for a number of other banks. He's also a former director of Telecom Italia. Uh, do we have uh, Enrico Semprebene? Uh, yes, en Enrico is senior banker for transport and logistics at BNL and originally trained as an auditor at Arthur Anderson. Um, and finally, Charles Spetka, who is managing director of Fortress Investment Group which has over 40 billion in assets under management. He's lately been working on Italian restructuring packages, seeking out opportunities Angelo for investors. Angelo's coming. Oh, Angelo's coming, great. <laughs> great, so we are back up to a full complement of six. Um, okay, let, yep, yep, no problems. So, well, let me start with um, Arturo, as a, as a well-known economist, right. Um, Many of us read the business pages in our newspapers. It's the first thing we turn to in the morning. And the analysis of the Italian economy and the Italian banking situation is often alarming, um, even in my own newspaper this morning. So what can, you, what can you tell us? What's the state of play in Italy? Well, uh, in general, uh, has it, on the general point of view, I can see that the Italian economy has strong fundamental. We are the second uh, uh, manufacturing system in Europe, just after Germany. And the Italian bank are going through a, a restructuring process. So typically, uh, what we see now are the problems of a system that is changing. And they are trying to... Uh, rebalance asset and liabilities and probably the shipping was one uh, the shipping companies the shipping loan have been one of the problems because in the same period we had two uh, circumstances first the uh, world crisis the world financial crisis and then the uh, changing rules of basel 2 and basel 3 that change the, uh, the scenario of the, banking, of the banking system. As far as the shipping industry is concerned, I think that also the shipping industry is going through a drastic change, but I can say the same thing than in general for Italy, the manufacturing system. The basis is strong. We have a strong intangible capital. We have knowledge. We have maritime cluster that is very strong. So in a way on a, or in a other, this kind of competencies, this kind of ability will be the 
uh, source will, be, will give the Italian system the strength to restart in, in such a way. The problem is that we are trying to understand what will be the proper uh, attitude, the proper um, form of this restarting. Okay, and as the director of an investment fund, um, how would you assess investor confidence in Italy right now? Can you honestly report that there's an appetite from people in other countries to invest in Italian shipping? As a matter of fact, the company, uh, I sit in a board of an investment company <coughs> who has two funds specialized in venture capital. And so venture capital is not so much the uh, proper kind of investment for, uh, uh, to invest in the shipping business. Um, the, the private equity fund, with the private equity fund, we try to do some in the shipping industry, but probably the shipping industry deserve a special uh, fund for them because it is not possible to use for shipping industry the same conditions, the same format typically used for uh, industrial companies, for the normal industrial companies. That's why, for example, um, the, uh, for example, Venice Shipping and Logistics is it's a fund, a fund with specific vocation to the shipping industry. Okay. Um, I've, got, I've got a question next for Massimo and Enrico because they are bankers. Um, obviously, there was a lot of coverage a few years ago about the crisis in the Italian banking system as it was described. Um, Newspaper readers were routinely told the Italian banking system was even close to collapse. Now, obviously that, that, that hasn't happened, so have we had a lucky escape? Okay. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, you know that uh, uh, Italian banks have experienced a uh, crisis. Um, some of them uh, have made uh, something important. As far as our group is concerned, we are the first uh, group that uh, merged. So two groups who merged uh, in the last two years, giving something uh, uh, about which we are very proud of uh, having transformed from cooperative system to uh, SPA and uh, not only to SPA, to a public company, because now we are a public company, not because we have uh, certain limitation in uh, voting power, but because we, are, uh, we don't have an anchor, uh, an anchor investor. Um, about, uh, so if the question is uh, how can, uh, how in the past uh, the, the, this situation has influenced the shipping lending, I don't see any influence. Uh, um, the, 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 the reason why shipping uh, doesn't have a, in my opinion, a material weight in the Italian banking system is probably due uh, for historical reason because uh, uh, it, the, 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 the uh, banking, Italian banking system was, uh, um, was uh, hasn't in the past uh, um, enough big player, which was created in the last uh, 20 years. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, no, oh, I, I don't see that there has been a problem um, from an Italian banking perspective uh, since uh, all the Italian banks that were alive uh, at that time before the crisis are still alive uh, in a different way. Obviously, there have been a sort of a merger between uh, many banks, uh, but uh, on, from a general point of view, we can say that the banking system has uh, uh, supported uh, well the, the, the economic crisis. So it's fine and it's still alive. The, 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 position, the, position, the position of... Uh, of uh, Enrico is uh, quite in the middle since he works for a, a, a French bank uh, which bought an Italian bank. Yes, uh, 
our bank did not have the BNP uh, any necessity to, to make uh, capital increase well, or to merge um, with other banks. So. Maybe let's ask some of the ship owners on the panel then, because yes, I, I see okay. you want to come in. So um, can, you, can you borrow the money you need, or <laughs> can you pay back the money you need? Um, no, actually, I would uh, also ask for something which, at the end of my speech, can be a little bit uh, revolutionary. Uh, because with Fabrizio, we started a time, long time ago about uh, speaking about uh, the relationship between uh, investors, investment fund, and uh, shipping companies. And uh, uh, I dare say that uh, when everything went good, we were very distant. Uh, with Fabrizio, we elaborate some schemes of improvement of our companies by managerialized uh, small companies. Uh, you know, the big companies are already have a, uh, you know, a path which uh, they follow, uh, you know, before <coughs> many uh, of the Italian shipping companies were, that were in, uh, yeah, let's say, in, uh, still in, uh, in, uh, in the small, medium size. And so we, we, we say then, we recognize that at that time, uh, the company was mainly based as one man uh, show and, uh, you know, like the ship owners, uh, you know, controlling everything and whatever. And this was not good to attract, uh, you know, the, the, the investors in, in our business. Uh, we tried to do this, uh, this, path and, uh, this path and we followed this and uh, we, we succeeded because if you uh, take a look at the company now, we have much more young people working in our company, much more skilled uh, uh, personnel. And uh, we uh, started from uh, the matter of fact that a ship owner cannot uh, know everything uh, about uh, everything, you know, you know, maybe cannot know about the finance as well as, uh, you know, maybe technical, uh, the technical side, the crewing, you know, the shipping company is a very complex company made up of many, many segments. And this is one side. On the other side, as a matter of fact, as was uh, uh, telling before, in this new scenario of the shipping, we need equity because uh, each investment is heavier and heavier even than before. I said this morning that uh, uh, the role of the ship owners changed a lot. Before, you know, the ship owner was the one able to manage old vessels and new vessels at the same time. Even consider better if you could manage old vessel rather than new one. The new one is so easy, the old one, mm -hmm. uh, you take the risk that others cannot take. So uh, now everything starts from the vessel. If you think now, for example, the very innovative vessel, let's say LNG, propulsion or dual fuel, uh, you know, scrubber on board or, you know, water ballast uh, uh, and all these things and, you know, should be very modern. Uh, we need to pay attention to which shipyard the, the vessel uh, has been built uh, because of, uh, you know, in case uh, you have to resell the vessel after years. So you need to take care of these parameters that before were not taking into account. Before it's, uh, I have the cargoes, I go there, uh, not matter what the ship. Is. So this is a matter of fact. Um, why I say that there can be a revolutionary approach? Because uh, what uh, uh, is, uh, you know, I'm asking all the time is uh, why don't either the banks or either the, uh, the investors, because we have, uh, of course, shipping company which are suffering at the moment and uh, which are, you know, with non-performing loans, uh, uh, as well as we have uh, uh, solid shipping companies, both big and small, whatever. But I say, why don't the bank or the investors approach the ship owner saying, why don't we do something together preserving your know-how? I believe that the know-how of the company should be at the center of the scene. Whether you are in distress or whether you are solid or financially, you know, speaking, yeah. you are, you know, quite uh, strong. Because at, at the end of the day, the ship owner is the one who knows how to manage vessels. So what uh, we understand since, you know, if, think about, for example, you know, one point uh, uh, in which uh, of this agreement between the investors and the ship owners was the duration of the intervention of the fund. Because, you know, if you, for example, like uh, example of before, you order a new vessel, it takes two years to build, and then the first two years passes without any revenue. The first year is the one more complicated, then you have two years of good revenue, so, and then you, uh, you need to face the way out. So it's something that scares the ship owner. I uh, imagine a world very different in which the ship owner will say, I am a managing company because I have the tradition of uh, several generations in doing that. Why don't you propose me? Can I, I, make the, I, I buy the vessel, which is the best vessel, you manage the vessel for me, rather than choosing your own structure of management and invading you know, the, the field of the ship owners. You know, this, I, I said this is, can be revolutionary. You know, we uh, sat on a table waiting for uh, proposals uh, from uh, investors that say, I want a vessel which is in compliance with all the new rules and regulations, which I can say all the time making a profit. No matter what, the ship owner is not, uh, uh, you know, should not be involved uh, in, in this. 
since we are ready under some extent also our generation to yes. be detached by the uh, emotional aspect of uh, I own yeah, three yeah. vessels, four, five, ten, uh, I am uh, better if I own more vessels. I am better if I manage the vessel better than the others. Probably this okay, <laughs> okay. I mean, I hear what you say, but you've, you've mentioned the word yeah. revolution several times. And and because we have never, yeah, you know, because the ship owners have never been approached by, by yeah, the yeah. You know, propositive ways. But, 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 but that's what I was going to say. The trouble with revolutions is that they mean the overthrow of the old ruling class. So, uh, <laughs> you know, do, do you foresee that the revolution that you wish would erode the power of the great Italian ship owning families? You know, uh, as I was telling before, not all the ship owners are ready for this revolution. We are getting, uh, you know, more and more prepared. But, you know, uh, it, there is no other way sometimes for companies, uh, you know, to grow. We cannot imagine a company which owned, for example, 10 vessels uh, now, uh, we have 15 years, uh, cannot replace probably 10 vessels uh, of two years, uh, two years old in, uh, in a few years' time. Because the, the equity they need is so much, uh, so much intense that uh, also the risk, you need to consider the risk. Family is risking his own money, so it's very risking now in the market which is so uh, variable, you know, and uh, this is not so, you know, we, we need stability. We need stability to, to grow uh, as it was before. Now, nobody can understand the future, really. Uh, when I talk to the previous generation or I talk to the new generation, really we don't know in uh, two years, three years time what really will happen. The cycles of shipping we always talked about are not the same, you know, the, independently from the duration. So, uh, right, but, but the old owning families would stay in charge? Sorry? You, you think the old owning families would stay in charge? I believe yes, yes, because you know we know how to do it. It's our life, it's our job. Okay. You know we know yes, how to do it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think this is a really interesting point. It's basically a problem of know-how. Yes. That uh, Arturo is the problem. I, yeah. I, I, I fully agree. Since the shipping is not only steel, it's also brains. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say this is a very interesting point, and I'd like to keep the discussion going along a bit. So. If anyone else would like to come back on this point, yes. do you another, agree, another do you disagree? Aspect, another aspect, I think that asset diversification is also more, uh, more important than in the past, especially because we are experiencing a higher volatility in, in return and risk in the value. So asset diversification for the traditional families owning uh, uh, shipping companies is much more important than in the past. Okay. And anybody else got any comeback on this point? Do you agree or disagree? Yeah. I would like to elaborate on the future uh, from the banking perspective because just looking at the past, uh, we just look at, uh, um, at uh, um, companies that uh, have not performed mainly. So we have. Uh, I, we are a listed company, so I can't give you, I can't disclose uh, uh, exact number, but the, the shipping sector has a um, danger rate uh, quite, uh, quite important. So why? That's the reason. That's the, the, the question that has to be um, that has to be answered. Can I answer to this? <laughs> it's just quite strange. I'm but very happy. To, to, I mean, it's not strange because we are used to. It. There are uh, non-performing companies that manage their vessel mo uh, lots better than performing companies. Absolutely. The, the reason was uh, only a, a matter of timing. They bought vessels when the vessel price was high. You know, just simple. Absolutely. Thing. Usually in the industry, we are uh, used to say is non-performing an industry which does Before not you. know how to make the product. <laughs> you know, this is the opposite what happened in in, uh, in shipping. You have performing company which are very very much skilled, more more skilled than the performing sometimes. You know, <laughs> sorry. And the mistakes, uh, the mistakes was uh, are then, uh, also uh, in the side of the banks. So if we have uh, financed uh, in a wrong way mm -hmm. or in uh, um, a, 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 in a time uh, which uh, was not favorable from the uh, chartered uh, cost uh, point of view, of course, then we have problem because we have uh, uh, financing which cannot be sustained uh, by the cash flow. So the lesson learned is first, um, considering that uh, we can't predict the top line because uh, chartered costs are something, I have prepared some slides, I don't know if uh, Regia can, uh, can present, but if you have a look of the forward uh, 
uh, the forward chartered cost and the actual cost, mm, no provision can be made. Yes. Because, yes. so the, 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 the only way to solve this issue from the bank point of view is to have lower leverage than in the past. It is not, uh, um, it is not uh, so strange that uh, most of the financing that uh, have defaulted, which doesn't mean that they are now uh, in a workout situation, maybe they are uh, in unlikely to pay situation, they have to be restructured, so I'm not uh, saying that uh, it's a big, uh, a so big problem. It's a problem that has to be managed. But what, what I want to mean is that at that time, probably during a general bubble, we financed in a wrong way with too much uh, leverage and now for the future we have to stay on a different leverage um, more conservative than about uh, culture of uh, shipping it's uh, a, um, an asset that has to be preserved um, managing a shipping company is not easy uh, you have to, um, to um, manage uh, uh, market, uh, client, uh, supply chain, people, uh, geopolitical uh, trouble when you, uh, are in a, in, when you have some uh, um, situation all over the world. So it's not a, 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 an, easy, an easy job uh, compared to certain manufactured companies. So the culture, what we call the culture of the district, which is the culture of certain, um, of certain uh, geography, are to be preserved. And from this point of view, having an alliance between a, a, in, an historical entrepreneur and an institutional investor plus a bank is a good, are some are, uh, crucial ingredients. Can I add? Sorry, first of all, I was late. Well, uh, since you, we have to manage many risks, uh, <laughs> I have something operational running just now, so I need to delete <laughs> outside. Uh, no, uh, I will surprise all of you. Uh, it's uh, the it's first time exercise. I'm absolutely in full agreement with Massimo Racca, because uh, what he says is exactly the same. So, uh, I mean, the problem of the crisis for the Italian shipping companies, but I would say any shipping company who made investments in the wrong timing, was really that we have invested all our equity first. Let me remember to everyone, to me first, that we put our equity first. So we are now seeing, so it's, we, we didn't, let's say, screw banks or, so our money was the first running and it was family money because it was not an international or public company. It's family company, traditional scheme, family money put inside. So we have bet all our net worth into this business. And of course, the, the only problem was the timing. So, and I'm not complaining with Massimo Racca, who I know since a while, and frankly speaking, that they have always kept, a, let's say, a cooperative attitude. So it, in a way that, let's say, the, a restructuring must be followed rather than a simply work out. Because it's absolutely true that today, these companies are efficient, they are managing relatively well, they are recovering in terms of market conditions. There is just a problem that there's a stock of leverage, which was created in the wrong timing, mistake made by both, uh, in, in which has been handled. What I'm complaining, it's really the rules that Massimo Racca and many other bankers has put, has, has decided to, 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 to give uh, and to, to, to play. So the, 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 the run after, let's say, the reduce of NPL and uh, unlikely to pay, it's uh, driving banks, in some cases, uh, some more than others, uh, uh, to decisions which are, in my opinion, wrong. Because this is an industry where, where, where a restructuring and stay together, running the business over a certain amount of time, it's by far more efficient than simply decide to dismiss a loan and allow my friend Charles Petka, let's say, right. to make some money out of that, or some of them. But of course, we need to look in front of the reality. So the reality is that these shipping companies in Italy, which have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of know-how, mm. need a deep restructuring. 
whether this will pass. We do much prefer, we would much prefer that it would pass through, let's say, jointly with the bank in a recovery period over the time. If it is not possible, we, then we need Mr. Spetka rent yeah, or Charles. someone else. But then at no. least we would like that this process to be done together. W what we really think is the worst thing to be done, and we have seen cases very recently with, uh, with another bank, so not by coincidence, the worst, uh, the, sure. let's say, the worst managed bank in Italy, Banca Montepaschi, they decided, let's say, to sell at, uh, you say, cents by, by the dollar, most of the shipping uh, position, simply because they were unable, let's say, to manage and to hand, and they were forced by the rules to dismiss the position into companies which were, let's say, potentially making money. Okay. Just uh, a comment on what uh, Angelo said. Uh, remember that uh, according to the calendar, which is a uh, document uh, issued by the ACB, uh, the supervised banks, uh, so the, the most important bank, 15 in Italy, has to uh, make provision on secured loans in unlikely to pay, uh, uh, to pay cl classification in seven years if they are secured yeah. or if they are unsecured in two years in two years then uh, the european union said that for secured uh, exposure the uh, provision 100 percent can be reached in eight years but it doesn't change uh, uh, too much uh, which is the point in seven years you can uh, restructure a position, for sure. Restructuring a position doesn't mean to reimburse the entire exposure. It's to have the company uh, risanata, uh, we say in Italian, so in condition of having cash flow um, to sustain the debt, right. this in general. This means that uh, uh, the uh, involvement of banks is to do restructuring in the proper way unless you are obliged by the regulator to deleverage position. That is another story. We have uh, been uh, obliged to sell MPL uh, starting from the merger between Banco Popolare and uh, uh, Banca Popolare di Milano, yeah, yeah. this was part of the agreement with the regulator which covered just the bad loans, so what we call sofferenze. As far as the UTP is concerned, we don't have any constraint. Of course, we do asset management because we don't want to destroy value, just selling if we are covered because uh, we did an, a, a share capital increase in the past and so we have a lot of money to put uh, in provision. And the, the point is to do um, restructuring in proper way. Then, after having signed a restructuring agreement, we have 12 months to monitor the position. If the position is performing, we can reclassify, we can classify back to bonus. So we don't need seven year. We just need one year yeah. to restructure, yeah. okay. one year yeah. to monitor. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, we have to understand that the position has been really, the, the crisis has been really resolved with again, doesn't mean that the debt has to be uh, reimbursed. You just have to have performance in line with the agreement, with okay. the plan. Yeah, yeah. And possibly, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you do a restructuring with all the debt bullet, if you just pay interest after one year, you okay. can't reclassify in bodies. But normally, the secure loans are normally, unless yeah. in the real estate uh, development, are normally amortizing yeah, okay, and are thank, unsustained yeah. by the cash flow. Yeah. I beg okay, thank, thank you very much. Of very, very, quickly. very, very quickly. I am keen to hear from Mark, who hasn't spoken yet. To say, because he's the only happy uh, part <laughs> this table. Yeah, he yeah. Hang on, Mark. We'll be with you in a minute. Yeah. The, 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 let me say that the pity and the funny story is that we see <laughs> companies which were absolutely unable 
to serve whatever loans. Because please do not forget that from time 12, 2012 to 2017, we were, we were looking with incomes about half of our running costs. So you cannot really, not even imagine to start paying any interest, whatever principle. In a moment where now the companies could eventually sit and agree a, a real restruct, restructuring on a, on a time basis where the bank has to make some sacrifice, where the company, generally speaking, all this family has made already a sacrifice. Most of the banks now they are looking in much more, uh, with much more interest, let's say, to dismiss these loans because sometimes it's easier. I'm happy to see Mr. Raka that it's not, because sometimes the decision is not, we, we, I'm sorry to say that, Massimo, but I, 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 I deeply believe in what I say. So whenever, even if into the official uh, ideal words, banks are there to create value, the true story is that very often the bank prefers, let's say, to save time. And sometimes the dismiss, the sale of the loans is the quickest, dirty and uh, fastest, let's say, possibility. I can, I could tell a precise okay, episode, yeah. which eventually I would avoid, otherwise I would get some, uh, I would say, criminal, uh, yeah. uh, come si dice, una querella per diffamazione, rischio, diciamo, nei confronti yeah. di una banca in particolare. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Mark, so, yeah, well overdue for a word. Um, I understand you've been coming over to Italy in search of opportunities for your investors. Um, can you tell us what you're finding out there? What, why should investors be interested in Italian shipping? Um, let me start by saying uh, my background, I am not a shipping expert. I'm probably the least expert shipping person in this conference. Um, my background is in, in real estate and then non-performing loans. Um, when I got, first got involved in shipping, I looked at it and I said to myself, um, it's a lot like real estate. You have managers, you pay management fees, you have income producing assets, you have charters like leases. And so there's a lot of similarities, but the problem is that it's very different actually um, because if I buy a piece of real estate in the middle of Manhattan, I buy the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, for example, that hotel occupies a certain space that no other property can ever occupy. If, I, if I'm invested in a ship or a vessel, that's a fungible asset to some extent, and so the pricing becomes very competitive and um, um, and so, you know, prices in shipping are very volatile as a result of the, the, the fungibility of the assets. Um, in addition, shipping has, you know, real estate has the same issue to some extent. I mean, there's supply and demand, but supply is not always rational in shipping. It's not always in real estate. Development gets ahead of use. But I think that it, my, my sense is that real estate supply is a bit more rational than in shipping. You know, ships get built you know, as prices are falling, the ships continue to get built. There are reasons why certain countries want to make sure their shipyards stay active and so they continue to build. So supply doesn't necessarily get into to, to line. Um, and then, you know, thirdly, you know, ships are depreciating assets. At, you know, real estate is also, but, you know, the Waldorf Astoria has been worth a lot of money for a very long time and will continue to be so. You know, ships will depreciate over life and then they'll go to the scrapyard. So all of those things make ship, the price of ships very volatile. And um, it's not real estate. It can't be financed in the same way. A 50% LTV loan on an, the Waldorf Astoria is a much different risk profile than a 50% LTV loan on a new LNG, let's not take LNG, on, on, a, on a new um, MR2. Um, because it's a, it's a fund. And so I think this is one of the fundamental issues uh, and then, you know, when it comes to investing in ships or vessels or companies that run ships, that's not really what we do. I mean, we, we, we have, we, we, we actually own quite a few vessels at the moment, um, but we're not long-term investors. I mean, we, we've bought, um, we bought vessels um, because we think the market's in a particular spot. We thought we bought them cheap to where the market is for some reason. 
Um, but we're not really long, you know, we, our, our business, and it's not every business, is not a long-term investor in shipping. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank, thanks, Charles. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, if, if we've got the time, if time allows, I'm going to come back to you about equity opportunities, um, especially in the U.S. But I know the time is counting down, and I know Fabrizio is has some questions that he'd yeah, like to ask a, too. Uh, so let me also buy the my brief snapshots. I, I can help, and I want to put some questions to. Massimo and uh, Enrico and involving also Angelo. So uh, please uh, start with the, the, the snapshots. Okay, so is, this is, a, for me, is a, like a pillars on this slide, since uh, I use it to counter the Mr. Dombrowski when I sit the, the first time uh, in front uh, of him to discuss about the uh, capital requirement rules uh, in uh, uh, European uh, Commission. So, and uh, this morning I heard a lot of uh, uh, things said about uh, the problem of communication of shipping industry and the Terry McAllister raised the question on the floor about the difficulties the, the, for the shipping to, to communicate adequately with, with the stakeholders. So and if I, I go through these figures, I see that the shipping is not riskier than real estate or other industries since the level of loss given default done by the shipping is not upper than or higher than the real estate, as well when the approach of the banker is prudent, so the prudent means that uh, the level of leverage is in the between the 60 and 80 percent, 60 and 70 percent, the risk to lose your money is very, very low since the loss given default is close to uh, 15 percent is not more than real estate or other industry. But the problem of the shipping is the communication. There is not knowledge in the bank system to adequately analyze these industries, in my opinion. And uh, so uh, beforehand, uh, Charles has spoken about uh, the high volatility of the shipping, but the shipping is uh, quite wide. Uh, and the range of uh, subsectors is very high, and uh, we have some sector at very low, low volatility, and the other sector, like the traditional Trump sector, like uh, tanker or dry, uh, for what uh, the volatility is very high. This is one point. Second point, situation so uh, does not run. Please can go ahead. Yes, this is a situation of the Italian uh, uh, market for shipping. Is that the fleet value is close to uh, 34 billions of dollars. The total outstanding debt buried on, the, on, the, on this ship is uh, 14 billions, and the bad loans are bad loans. So the problematic loans are roughly 7.6. This situation seems to say us that is not uh, bad, since the value, the total fleet value is uh, 34 billions of dollars, and the, the debt buried on the fleet is uh, 14. But uh, it's a misleading, uh, a misleading indication, since in the, in the 34 billions of dollars is included the, the high value of uh, Ropax, Roro, uh, and specialized in the fleet, uh, mostly owned by one of the main players is sitting in this uh, floor, is uh, uh, Grimaldi, represented by Diego in, uh, in the floor. And uh, in, uh, uh, in the parallel, in the opposite uh, side, the debt buried on this fleet is a very, very low. So it's a very well balanced. And if I read the balance sheet of Grimaldi, I see that the leverage is close to 50%, probably. Le so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Diego, is uh, correct. And uh, unfortunately, the problems come from the glute or for the uh, party 
uh, over 2006 lived for the bulk sector and tanker sector. Can so I let me let me just let me show this uh, this, uh, this slide, Angelo, where the value of uh, bulk fleet is close to 1.7 uh, billion of dollars, but the debt uh, the, so the fleet is 0 0.9, but the debt buried on this is 1.7. Uh, uh, the loan to value now at current market is more than 189%. And the same we live for the tanker, where on the base of the our current market, the level of uh, loan to value is close to 144%. So uh, I like to have your, to get your opinion about the level of knowledge uh, of Italian banks in the shipping is a problem for me, live as advisor or investor, and as well, uh, how you think this is the best way to overcome the problem in order to preserve the huge, huge, huge know-how and knowledge, which is probably the main asset for these uh, industries. Uh, for you? Can I, can I add something? Because then I want to defend the issue. Italian bank. So you didn't say, I was exactly asking myself because that is the clear the reason that so you see that basically all the bulk fleet it's into NPL or UTP and most of the tanker fleet. But the only reason is because let's say there were vessels ordered where the market was skyrocketed. But let me say something on top. Oh, you are, of course, you know, of course, but it's maybe better that everyone knows. The largest lenders at that time that were not absolutely Italian, Germans. French somehow, UK, Royal Bank of Scotland bankrupt, HSH bankrupt, the Commerce Bank almost bankrupt. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say, Italian banks and Italian owners, they were in good, let's say, company, in good uh, uh, company with Germans, French, UK, worldwide. So it's true that everyone made a mistake. By the way, let's say, we as a family, we thought that the, the market could change, so we decided in 2010 to fix all but Andrew, our own fleet on a, on, on a five are, to seven years charter, and at the end of 2012, o, 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 out of these 19 parties, only one remained yes, alive. You, so. you are touching uh, the other uh, face of the problem, uh, and I uh, leave uh, uh, Enrico and uh, Massimo to reply. So is uh, the, the uh, lack of knowledge uh, internally of our uh, banks uh, in order to support the industry. As there are two problems. The problem of communication, since probably the ship owner are not able to communicate adequately uh, the, the business models. And secondly, the ability of the banks to arrange the internal teams dedicated to shipping and uh, all the story in order to face this industry, mostly in the, in the, in the troubles. Can I, can I say something? Fabrizio, hi. Um, you know, when I looked at the chart, I'm not sure if it's accurate or not, but when I was speaking, I was talking about tankers and bulkers in particular because they're particularly commodities. The things that we've invested in, and we have made some investment, typically they're asset classes that have some particular um, competitive advantage. So we have, um, you know, ferries, we have um, handy class, we have, you know, things that there's, you know, where it has an edge. Um, but the commodities, we, we stayed away from from a long-term investment because we see a lot of volatility. And so the, 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 the value, the ship owners and the managers are very important. You know, these are the, the, some of the best, and we've met some of the best Italian ship owners, and there are, very, there are many very good Italian ship owners, um, managers. Um, but the value they bring is sometimes, not always, but sometimes dwarfed by the volatility of the asset and the asset. So today is a good, you know, in our opinion, we're, we're buying vessels, today is a good time to buy because we're at a low, um, particularly in, you know, maybe tankers. I think it's a general opinion people have. I'm, again, I'm not an expert. This is just kind of a firm wide view. But you're, you're making a bit of a bet on the volatility of the vessel. And then, you know, if we were a buyer, we would hire one of the great managers. Charles, you are marking a very uh, strategic point for the change of the shipping and uh, looking uh, in, the, in the new uh, future of shipping, uh, uh, which was the, 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 the word uh, heard la yesterday, today, 
uh, since the, the, the uh, words of Peppino D'Amato yesterday and uh, also this morning from young ship owners, uh, we have to adapt the shipping to new models. And I, I, is a, is a well sound to hear from you that there is a, a substantial difference between the vulture fund or speculative fund and the turnaround fund. So I am very, very uh, happy to hear your comment about uh, remarking uh, the difference between these different approaches uh, of the financial investors when they approach and stay close to the company in order to help the recovery or when uh, the approach is only uh, aiming to a speculative uh, uh, gain. Um, I, you know, is another, uh, this discussion is the current discussion day by day with Massimo and uh, or Angelo when we have our uh, professional uh, yeah. uh, uh, discussion. No, no, I am interested to, to hear your comment you about know, I can only comment on what we do. Um, you know, typically, we all, and not just in shipping in Italy, and across our business lines, we typically align ourselves with people who are very good at what they do. We have local particular expertise, so the ship owners in Italy or whatever the case may be to help us find opportunities and work together to, to create opportunities. Um, and so the view, the value, uh, it, you know, um, and we value that expertise quite a lot. And that's, that's across everything we do. You know, we won't invest in an asset class because we have a great manager. We'll find a great manager because we want to invest in an asset class. Um, you know, here, one of the things we're doing a lot, we're trying to do, it's been with some success, but it's been challenging is to work with the ship owners and the banks to try to broker a resolution. Um, it's quite complex. I mean, as you, everybody here knows, I mean, these situations are very complex. Um, and, you know, we try to do that in a way that everybody, including us and our investors, wins um, in, that, in trying to bring a resolution. That's our approach. Um, you know, there are other approaches, but that's what we try to do. It's interesting that you invest on the brains in order to help the ship owners to overcome the crisis. You invest in the knowledge, uh, as Massimo comment is very, very precious uh, on this topic, uh, in order to overcome the crisis, in order to overcome the bad time. Yeah, so but it's, it's purely selfish. I mean, it's just because we want the best people to work okay. with us. It's not because we're trying to, you know, we, we're not altruistic, we're not, you know, we're, we're a fund trying to make money. We just think that's the best way to make money. But preserving uh, culture is not enough. Uh, there is a matter of dimension, which is to be, uh, which is to be uh, followed as a, as a, as a strategy. Uh, because f from this point of view, there is no difference between a traditional manufacturer business and shipping. They have same problem in for, uh, I mean, for uh, OPEX, uh, for general and administration cost. Uh, so um, what you said before, what banks can do in order to uh, permit an improvement of the shipping sector? For example, helping uh, consolidation and process. Uh, so this is the point, uh, Massimo and uh, Jose Rico, if the banks can help. Uh, uh, can easy the, 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 and facilitate the, the process of uh, consolidation since the shipping is uh, changing as, uh, uh, several times and uh, with, with uh, uh, Andrea we comment the change in the uh, business model pattern uh, where the shipping is becoming a uh, low margin business where the size is uh, crucial and uh, the consolidation process may be facilitated by the role played by the banks. Uh, so I don't know if you agree, Enrico and... Uh, well, I would uh, the BNP Paribas is one of the few banks uh, which Increasing. does not downside the, porf the, the portfolio. The size of the portfolio. Well, uh, this portfolio. What I would like to, to discuss here also, it's a, a general view on the Italian ship finance market because uh, it's quite interesting to see what has happened in the, year, in the past uh, and what brought to the current situation because uh, I, I started 20 years we ago. We never learn from the past in the shipping. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, it's, it's useful to, to understand which, which is the current situation for the Italian market, uh, uh, from my perspective and my opinion. So, 
Um, I heard from Angelo, um, uh, one of the question was the lack of experience uh, of Italian banks in supporting uh, financial comp fin uh, shipping companies, which was the, uh, uh, a fact uh, indeed. Uh, when the, the booming of the Italian companies uh, uh, arrived, they decided to invest a lot of money uh, in shipping. Uh, Italian banks did not have the, uh, uh, the, the correct, the right credit metrics to evaluate uh, the, the shipping investment. Um, uh, they had more a corporate approach, more than an asset approach. Okay. And um, so many mistakes was done by the banks in that period of time, uh, thinking that uh, lending and shipping uh, was a matter of uh, pricing, uh, at that time, I, I mean, in the years 2005, 2009, uh, there was a problem of excess of liquidity, so cheap capital to be invested, uh, to be lended. Okay. And uh, so the, the corporate approach was one uh, of the point there, and, uh, uh, and the excess of liquidity was the other one. Okay. Uh, it, at that time, that was the first, uh, the main, uh, the, the, the third point was that uh, financing a, a ship uh, maybe it's better than financing another, a different asset, like, uh, uh, say, say, because obviously okay. uh, the vessel uh, is, uh, can be moved, uh, has a, a lot of information on the fleet, on the charter, uh, a lot of data which can be used to evaluate uh, a loan. The, the, the rating, <laughs> but to give the rating. From legal point of view, it's just a matter of due diligence, so <laughs> banks uh, cannot be worried uh, about a certain sector because it's complicated from a legal point of view. Um, there is another point that is to be um, understood. Um, if we have lost 100 million euro in shipping sector, uh, the first answer uh, should not be for the future, I don't want to invest anymore in this sector. The first, act, the first answer is to be why I have lost 100 million euro. Okay. Where and when I have uh, make a mistake? So it's, uh, I, I want to, um, to do outing <laughs> from this point of view, but in several occasions I have heard uh, this approach, which is completely wrong, because we have to do bank uh, today, tomorrow, as we did in the past. Our duty, to our stakeholders, both uh, people who lodge money in our account as well as stakeholders, as well as uh, authority, is to do uh, the thing well, is to do correct assessment. So we, just to do an example, just to, to say that real estate is not so different. Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, I was not working for, for this bank, but I have learned uh, something in the last year. How our approach was to finance, uh, as an average, 80% of each initiative, including the, including the land. So land and capex, 80% of leverage, and 20 equity. Now we um, support only 60% of the capex and no financing support to the land, to the area, which means uh, approximately 45% of the overall cost, because we have understood that those leverages were wrong. As a That's the point. So the solution is not to say, I don't, wa I don't want to play anymore this, uh, Massimo, this game Massimo, uh, because uh, it's too dangerous. I, I, think, th I think that we are uh, uh, going to the, uh, let me say, a combination of sources for shipping coming from the private capital and the traditional capital. And probably the loser on this game, on this pitch, is the public market. And I have a question for Arturo, if uh, you can help me by the slides. You can run the slides. Fabrizio, have you... Have you so? 
Okay, okay. Are you Ar Arturo, 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 please, please, one moment. I, uh, I have to show you some figures. Uh, yeah. Quite uh, self-explanatory. So, since th this is the performance, uh, the public market performance is in the equity, how the main sectors of shipping uh, on the different horizon, on the five-year base, the return for main sectors is negative for the wide range, all range of subsectors. Was the uh, performer was the bulk, uh, mark, marked uh, minus 73%. The best, so let me say the best uh, is uh, the LNG, the minus 9%. Yes, the best. So the market, public market is practically totally disappointed since a lot of investors was eluded by so extraordinary retards. So we leave also a lot of uh, uh, cases of uh, mismanagement uh, uh, and uh, behaviors and also uh, conflict of interest. The last one was the case of Scorpio Bulk, which invested uh, and baked uh, the uh, capital increase of tank, uh, Scorpio Tanker, is quite, quite, is a, I have not comment about, let me say. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so, and uh, dramatically dropped also the source of financing, so this is uh, the trend of uh, public issues. Practically, we have not public issues in the last uh, three years. Uh, and uh, the last one was good bulk foiled. And, uh, and uh, as well, also, uh, the breakdown of the different sectors of shipping for capital rise in the public market. You grew at Columbia University. What's your comment about? You grew in the uh, New York financial capital market. Uh, it's difficult to answer to your question simply because the last seven, ten years have been too difficult to be considered as a proper sample. But the, my idea is that in the stock market you need a certain critical mass. Critical mass of research, critical ma mass of analyst, critical mass of, han of interest. If you consider the percentage of the shipping industry listed in the New York Stock Exchange compared to all the rest of the business is a small portion. There is only one stock exchange that can, could be considered a specialist stock exchange, this is the Oslo Stock Exchange. I would, it would be interesting to see this data for the Oslo Stock Exchange, not on a general level. As far as Italy, Italy is concerned, I can say that we are only we are talking about but peanuts, generally speaking, just two companies. Generally speaking, we have to reflect about the approach to be held when we approach the, the, the equity capital market. I think my that in the in your talk, in your idea about the new business model, probably there is some room for public market, even if not uh, public. Uh, equity at least for public debt. Okay. There could be some space for this kind of uh, uh, deals. Uh, I leave you there. At this point, it's an ideal opportunity to bring back Charles, which I said I would do. Um, Charles, I've heard various opinions on the openings for shipping companies um, for public debt for equity in New York. Um, I hear that some people at the recent Capital Link Forum in New York suggested that the lull was only temporary and the opportunities are still there. But um, you're the expert. How do you see it? Well, I think practically. Is this working? Um, no, I'm actually not the expert. Right. <laughs> I think I just established that in my earlier comments. <laughs> but you're supposed to be. Would you have an opinion can anyway? I, but, um, can I, can I see? Yeah. Can I ask you? I, 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 have, I have a reply for you. Yeah, Fabrizio, can you go on the slide? Uh, no, that one. The slide on the market. Uh, yes, the performance. Sorry. Go back on the performance. The, the five years performance. Can you before the slide on the performance for the five years? Ah, this is. Okay. 
I mean, opportunities are there. Go on the bulk and see the one-year-to-date performance. It's 18%. What, what I'm trying to say. So anyone who invested beginning of 2000 or mm -hmm. October, September, October 17, mm -hmm. made actually, let's say, 20% or and maybe more. I, I, it's simple. I, I, because, uh, I mean, uh, Opportunities are there, but, and it's uh, just a matter of time. Angelo, stock market, and generally speaking, as my ethical position in the capital market is that the shipping is not gambling. Shipping is an industry. We have to approach the investment in the shipping as a, an industry, not as a gambling. If I want to, to do gambling, I go to the betting uh, shop uh, around the corner to play on the soccer matches. Will, but, but let me okay. reply on that. I will, I will make Charles' life easier. Charles is here because he, he knows <laughs> that one year ago yeah, there was yeah. like 25% l l lower, maybe even 50% in some cases. So they are more opportunistic, let's say, and they see the value there. And possibly now they're willing to enter into this market because they see that eventually something may happen in the tank business in the near future. Anyway, okay. this is not asset return, it's the equity return. Right? Yes, but come on. Okay. Say, if you duplicate, if you, it's interesting, if you, do, if you, if you take the BDI no, no, no. or the BPI or and the market uh, uh, moving and you put on the, on the average, you will, you will, will, will show that the performance of the public right. company so is absolutely identical to the performance of the market. The timing is uh, one yeah, of the, the best. The, yeah, the timing's running short, but I'm going to go for Can one I, yeah. last comment. Yes, yes. Just a few, few words, because uh, from uh, what we were saying today, we sometimes uh, are losing the view of the ship owning uh, uh, industry like an industry, and, uh, you know, we make a parallel and in a certain way it is with the real estate but a part is real estate and a part is even more complex than an industry Correct. it would be very interesting to to have uh, actually um, yeah. a slide uh, with the performing vessels in the world uh, uh, Italian vessels that failed in his uh, uh, you know target because they were blacklisted uh, as a flag yes. uh, detained, uh, yeah. detained by yes. the administrations yes. Yes. Or blacklisted by charters. Leader whatever. in market and We niches. have a flag which is one of the Angelo knows more restrictive, and our vessel performs quite good. So, the non-performing loans are something belonging to the past, but they exist. So I don't blame the bank when they say I have to recover, you know, the money in some way. But this is the past. And then there is a future of a company which gathered know-how in generations. How we exactly. can mix, uh, yeah. mix, uh, mix it up, everything. I suggest to do, for example. If uh, I said, and I was uh, um, um, uh, listen very carefully to what Mr. Raka said, if a vessel gain value now, I want to sell the vessel because it's my time now, because I supported the industry. Uh, and Angel always said, I also said uh, very, um, uh, which is the truth, that the, the family also invested this money. So uh, the, my fear is that uh, if you support the management of a company which is non-performing, uh, only until you sell the vessels, yes. uh, you not, do not incentivate to grow. to grow. So you have to say, if uh, uh, let's uh, you know mix it up everything. The uh, shipping company can be considered for a, a period of time as a management company. I will use your company. I sell uh, the yeah. asset when it's the right moment. But I, if I have Should to buy a new vessel now, Correct. because it's a okay. moment, I give to you. Correct. So you incentivate to, uh, to hire grow. new managers, yeah. uh, to improve your structure, uh, you know, you, to give perspective. Because yeah. without perspective, there is no growth. Okay. This is my yeah, humble thanks. opinion. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, you can always depend on a mainly Italian panel for a lively discussion. So can we have a round of applause, please, for your uh, fantastic... And um, b before you all disappear, can I just say a few words in closing the conference um, to my fellow shipping professionals. For uh, those of us who are visitors anyway, it's nearly time to once again say our river dirty to Naples. And as ever at the annual Shipping and the Law event, participants will have learned much in only a short amount of time. The opening remarks from the politicians will have taught us non-Italians more about what is happening in the country, and the insights from well-known Greek and Italian ship owners yesterday morning will give us a sense of where our industry is going in the coming period. Um, we all know that the IMO sulfur cap um, will be a challenge between now and the start of 2020, and indeed beyond. And it was fascinating to find out how preparations are advancing. 
In the afternoon, we honored Francesco Berlinghieri, the Dean of Italian Maritime Law, and we learned more details of his remarkable life. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone in this room when I extend deepest condolences to his family and to his loved ones for their loss. The Places of Refuge debate underlined the debate we all owe to seafarers who make possible international trade. And it is our duty to minimize the dangers that they all too often face. Um, this morning, the youth had their say. And after that, we've heard from the lawyers and then the financiers. And so after just one and a half days, the ninth edition of Shipping and the Law must now draw to a close. Um, at this point, it's customary to say thank you to the organizers of this conference, Studio Legale Lauro. We all owe gratitude, I think, to our generous host, Francesco. Also, I must sing the praises of the SLL team behind the scenes, whose hard work made all this possible. I'm thinking here of Laura Valentina and that remarkably talented soprano, Erin, and all the others whose names I, I, I may not know. Thanks, too, to all the speakers, who, of course, have been too many to name, and to all the sponsors for their kind backing. Lastly, can we show our appreciation for the staff at this magnificent venue, which is so very different from the dreary, concrete conference halls that most of us seem regularly doomed to frequent. Um, I don't want to keep anyone from lunch, and then after that, the guided tour of San Lorenzo Maggiore's architectural treasures. But before I go, let me leave you with a quote from one of the great leaders of our industry. To be happy, Aristotle Onassis advised, make sure you attend, live in an expensive building, even if you have to stay in the cellar, go out to expensive restaurants, even if you can only afford one drink, and if you have to borrow, borrow a lot. And uh, he should have added, make sure you network at the right shipping conferences. I hope to see many of you again at Shipping and the Law 2019. <laughs> Thank you for the bit, Thank you.